good afternoon. And for those of you who have been uh, waiting patiently on YouTube while uh, uh, Joint Justice Oversight had a lunch break and while they were waiting for the uh, Joint Child Protection Oversight Committee to meet. Our two committees are um, the focus of this afternoon and of the next, um, the next three hours is to um, focus on justice involved youth. And uh, we have a long list of uh, individuals who are help, can help us with the decision and recommend, recommendations. But first we were gonna start off with uh, legislative council and uh, Bryn to keep us focused on what our uh, task is for today. Did you want to add anything, Senator? Okay. Bryn. Good morning, committee, or good afternoon, sorry. So um, I, you know, I was not prepared to share anything with the committee this um, at this meeting. Um, we did speak at the last meeting about the um, your general sort of tasks and directives for um, this particular item on the agenda. So I, since you have such a large number of witnesses and kind of a compressed amount of time, I wasn't sure if you wanted to hear me um, do that again. So I, I didn't plan to, but I would be glad to if you would like me to. You're muted, Em. Early I'm out of practice. Thank you. Um, Bryn, um, two minutes to refocus us because not everyone was able to be here last um, time, especially some of the people who were testifying, they weren't in the room, they may have been um, on YouTube. And I just, so that we all are on the same page. Sure. So um, the in this last legislative session, um, there was a directive to this committee um, to hear a recommendation from the Department for Children and Families about um, the long-term plan for justice-involved youth, um, youth that have been historically served by Woodside. Um, and it was the directive of this to this committee that they make a listen to that recommendation from the department and to make their own recommendation to the Joint Fiscal Committee about whether or not to adopt the plan um, that's put forward by the department. So that's sort of a, a high level overview of what you're tasked with doing. Um, and I think as you hear from the reporters, you're gonna get the details of what, your, um, what, what that recommendation entails, including comparisons, um, fiscal comparisons, and also um, expertise comparisons. So um, I will leave it at that since you've got a lot of witnesses um, with probably a lot to say. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so in service of that, uh, one of the first witnesses that we um, have is uh, Stephanie Barrett from Joint Fiscal. Um, hello. Uh, um, I don't have a testimony prepared. I did, Peggy did send out a side-by-side -side comparative document, um, which took the information on the operating costs um, and put them on one page so that the committee could have an easier time seeing where the differentials were. Um, and um, here, um, the, 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 the um, estimates or estimates that were provided either by Beckett on one side or by DCF on the other side. And so if members of the committee have questions about that, I'm here, but beyond that, I don't have additional um, testimony. <laughs> Stephanie, that's perfect. I'm wondering if you, if, um... Peggy, if you could share, or does um, Stephanie need to share that document so people can look at it right now? And Yep, I can pull it up. Just give me one sec. Okay. And what we'll do is wait, see if there are any questions. And then if not, we will go on to, um, to Sean Brown, who is Commissioner of DCF. Hmm. Sorry guys, it takes a minute. Okay. Share screen. Mm -hmm. 
on the website of the joint just a uh, joint committee also yep it's on the website if you'd rather do it that way because you won't really be able to see everybody that's the only problem good point um so for those of you who can do that it's on the website of um, both committees uh, if I might ask a question, Stephanie. Sure. Stephanie, um, the major difference in the two seems to be the benefits afforded to state employees, not necessarily the salaries. It, there is a little differential on the salary, but the benefits is the biggest driver. And then um, obviously the contracts and overall operating expenses are, are somewhat different too. But benefits, I would say, are the primary driver of the differential. And I did in my note preface that these are estimates. They're not, you know, the it's not a it's it, it's not an actual amount on the Beckett side. It's an estimate that those negotiations are still underway. And obviously, um, the estimates on the state employee side, um, you know, they're they're the internal service funds, especially on the operating side, would be you know you'd actually have to have the program up and running to to fully understand the, you know, whether some of the um, the Woodside costs, which are the basis for the operating expenses, might be different under this new programmatic um, design if it was operated by state employees. But that's it's a little bit harder to make those sort of apples to apples comparisons. But um, it gives you the, the the best estimates that we have right now on an operating basis. There's um, uh, for comparative purposes, um, and you can see where those differentials are. So Stephanie, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at the operating expenses and supplies down at the bottom and I'm on both version, both for Beckett and the state. And then I'm looking on the Beckett about rent. Yep. 120,000, like that explained what the rent entails. And then I'm also wondering, have you, in, and I know this may be difficult because you don't have <clears throat> square footage of a building, but do you have so it, fee for the, space? Do you have fee for space included in that operating budget for Woodside? So on the Woodside, I believe that's the fee for space is included because that's based on Woodside's current um, operating expenses. Um, I'm going to let the commissioner perhaps speak to the rent piece. That's an internal to Beckett um, structure. I think that has to do with their current mortgage. It's a it's an operating cost internally to them, not the rent that the like the, between state and Beckett would be. Um, so I, the, I'm i gonna let the commissioner speak to that piece. Um. Yes, so the rent uh, on the Beckett proposal um, is the fee that the state would pay for the use of the, the, the facilities in the grounds um, uh, in Newberry. Um, and that is based on you know, the cost of, of their mortgage for the property, um, and then also um, upgrades that they have made to the property in terms of uh, wastewater and other investments. And so that, that is recouping their cost on that facility and covering uh, their monthly cost of that, which is in that rent line item of 120,000 a year. So essentially 10,000 a month. It does raise an issue though, since we're gonna be paying their rent, them rent, but we're putting $3 million into the facility and some kind of money for uh, construction, right? Yes. And how does, and that doesn't get paid back? So if we So we had, pay them rent plus we're improving their facility? Uh, yes, um, that rent line item would be significantly larger if they oh, okay. made the investments and then build that back to us and amortized it over uh, the cost of the of the lease. Are they PMI? Would they be PMI regulated? No, this would not be a PMI uh, facility. Uh, <clears throat> but the girls, the Bennington, the Vermont School for Girls, I keep, keep in Bennington. That is PM&I, correct? 
Well, we are changing the nature of our relationship with with the uh, Vermont that that program you just mentioned, also Depot, where uh, historically they have been uh, PNMI, but as we've um, moved to expand our system of care and uh, we have contracted with certain beds in each of the depot in the Vermont School for Girls facility to not be PNMI, but that they're contractual beds that would be similar to this as we've oh, okay. expanded our system of care. So there, it's a hybrid in those models. Okay. <clears throat> those of you who don't aren't familiar with PNMI, it's private non-medical institutions, which the, the division or rate setting comes in and sets what can be uh, used for expenses. Uh, and I do remember when I worked uh, at Depot, they would come in and tell me what my salary was because I was only part-time because I was in the legislature. So I've always had this deep uh, love for the division or rate setting. <laughs> so I have another question, and this may be more for the commissioner. Um, in operating costs for the Beckett, where is the maintenance? There need to be some maintenance there. Would that I see clinical? I see under clinical staff. There's fifty-two thousand for maintenance. Um, there's going to be repair work that will probably need to be done to the building, um, and then just your also regular maintenance. Is that going to be done? negotiated with Beckett to do that, or is that gonna be the state responsible for that? No, that would be Beckett responsible for maintaining the property in general, and then also for any damages that occur that need to be repaired. Thank you. I have a question. Go ahead, Senator. Uh, so last time we talked about a hybrid model, um, with state employees and a Beckett uh, facility concept. And so does the state of Vermont operated equivalent represent that? Or, and uh, Stephanie, is that part of this? Um, or it, would, that, would there be things that we would add or subtract from that column? I can't see if Stephanie is there, but she sent me an email that she had to step away to deal with a family situation. Okay. Maybe, uh, Commissioner, maybe you could um, weigh in on that one. Um, <clears throat> uh, could you repeat your question, Senator? I'm sorry that they were mowing the lawn outside my office, so I had trouble hearing for a second. That's okay. That's better than the F-35s that have been going over <laughs> my house. Um, the last time we talked about having a hybrid model with, uh, you know, state employees and, and then the Beckett uh, facility, but we'd still have an investment in the facility. Um, so I'm looking at the state operated, uh, state of Vermont operated equivalent, and I'm wondering which part of that is consistent with a hybrid model and, or is that the whole hybrid model? But how how would it be different? Well, I, I think it would depend, Senator, on on if if that was a, a possibility of one how it was structured. Um, so if um, I'm aware of VSEA has put forth a proposal that um, mm -hmm. Beckett would um, uh, oversee um, kind of and manage the program, but then have state staff. Um, operate the program. So if you looked at it in, as that was the model, I think you would see that the, the management staff cost on the Beckett side of this spreadsheet would be kind of what you'd be looking at there. That might, that could change depending on the nature of, of this agreement, um, you know, but then also if you looked at on the state side, um, you know, the, the other staffing positions below the management staffing box there, um, those would be the cost for, for state employees to actually operate and, and um, run the programming in that facility. Uh, one caveat, I would say that this proposal looks at um, it, it um, from a point of view of new staff coming in so that they would be at the beginning of the pay scale. So if um, existing uh, staff that um, 
worked in the program before it was shut down and those positions were eliminated. Um, we're operating this, those, those costs would go higher because those were staffed with higher salaries. Senator Lyons, I, I, I just want to clarify that um, we may have mentioned um, a hybrid model as something that some people were considering and we all got um, a statement from the BSEA that they would like us to um, put forth that. We did not ask, and that was not part of our charge necessarily, and we did not ask Stephanie to do a third column. No, I understand that. I, um, I think my, I asked to have the department come in with uh, a hybrid, but um, maybe it wasn't clear enough and I'm fine with that at this point. Um, uh, while we have uh, the operating budget comparison up uh, here, do we have other questions for this or can we take it down and um, ask? Uh, Chairman Pugh. Yes. Which, um... Representative Shaw. Thank you. Uh, I do have a Bit of a question, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out if I'm looking at apples and apples or apples and oranges here. Uh, we assume we look at the Beckett program and uh, assume or says it's being operated in, in Wells River, uh, and I'm fairly sure it's in their facility. I look at the state of Vermont operated equivalent. Uh, can the commissioner uh, explain to me uh, where that facility may be? and what may possibly the uh, fee for space charges may be uh, in that facility. And also at the bottom of the comparative sheet, we have uh, government or general administration and overhead of a half a million plus dollars for Beckett, but none in for the state equivalent. Maybe you could explain that to me also. Um, uh, Commissioner, is that something you can answer or- you repeat? I'm sorry, the lawnmowers were again outside my window. I apologize. <laughs> Want to try it again, Commissioner? Yes, please. Okay. I'll try to say the same thing twice. Uh, the Beckett proposal uh, is obviously in Wells River in their facility. I think that's been a conversation right along. And uh, the state of Vermont operated equivalent, where may that be? Uh, and so that we can compare apples to apples. Uh, and then uh, I guess that simplifies my first question. The, the last part of the question was at the bottom of both comparatives, uh, you have general administ administration and overhead for Beckett at five point or $578,000 and none for the uh, SOV operated equipment. And maybe you could explain that differential to me also. I'm assuming, I'm assuming if, if the uh, SOV operated equivalent is somewhere that's going to have to do either pay rent or do fee for space. Where might we find that? Yeah. So if you um, turn to the report that that we submitted, anticipated before the last uh, the testimony of the last time before these committees, um, we did indicate um, that it would uh, be approximately. Um, based on BGS's estimates, approximately $5.3 million to build a new state facility. And that did not include the purchase uh, of land. At this point, uh, we would need to go out and locate a, a piece of land to locate a state run facility. That work has not occurred. Um, so that would be work that would need to happen. But, if it, but based on kind of what were the square footage in the program we're building with Beckett, BGS estimates it would be about $5.3 million for the building and permitting and whatnot of that facility, uh, exclusive of the purchase of land, which we would need to locate. Um, hey. In terms of your question regarding the general admin and overhead, and that's a normal line item you would see in many of our grants and contracts that our providers are allowed um, a certain percentage um, to account for um, the other services that they bring to manage these type of programs that are not accounted for um, in these direct costs, that that might be um, uh, uh, financial office staff's time 
um, to process billing and support the work of, of, of this facility. Um, IT staff that might that they might bring in from their other programs to help um, on IT solutions. In the state of uh, state of Vermont, you might see those costs reflected in the internal service funds for like um, ADS or in the commissioner's office. Um, you would see those as general admin cost. Here, they just get reflected differently because they're contractual. Okay, so I, it, I represent Shaw. I think one of the things that um, Stephanie would explain when she made this up, it was looking at a hybrid where um, state employees would work at the Beckett facility. And instead of having um, Beckett employees, there would be state employees. And so that that was was the hybrid discussion we had at the last meeting, I believe, that led to these figures. Um, no, no. Similar um, to the vet. No, and isn't what you did? So no, these these figures were actually compiled by by DCF. Um, oh, okay. I mean, it, it does it does assume an actual equivalent program, um, but it doesn't make the assumption that state employees would be able to um, operate the program specifically at the Wells River facility. Oh, okay. It well, does not standing, do that. It's a <laughs> I couldn't see you come back, Stephanie. So yeah, I'm sorry. I just to... had to step out for a moment. <laughs> okay. And then. Back to the commissioner, if I may. So the Becca program, we were putting something like three point something million dollars into the, their facility, just trying to get the figures uh, correct, uh, lined up. Is that true? Correct. So, yep. And then, uh, so at the end of the day, uh, how would you, where would you show fee for space in the state of Vermont operated equivalent? Should you have uh, a grant? That would be um, if you look on the on the right of the spreadsheet on the state of Vermont operative equivalent. If you look at the uh, down towards the bottom, about one, two, three, the fifth line up, ops operating expenses and supplies of six hundred and seventy-five thousand. Um, th that's based on the operating budget for Woodside. Um, that would be the fee for space is most likely included in there. I think Sarah Truckle from our business office is on as well. And if she is, she could confirm that. But my understanding, it's embedded in that number right there. Thank you. That's correct. And thank you. <laughs> Are there other questions right now that relate to uh, this operating budget comparison sheet? I think I think so, Ann. <laughs> um, um, Commissioner, was there any consideration um, or conversation with Beckett about purchasing the facility, about the state um, purchasing the facility in Newberry? So initially, there, there were not conversations to purchase uh, the facility, but after uh, our last uh, testimony and discussion before these committees, um, we did go back and start um, a conversation with Beckett in terms of the, the terms of the lease and then what other options might be available. And while those conversations are preliminary at this point and there's still a long ways to go, we are envisioning somewhere along the line of um, a 10-year lease commitment um, where we would recoup back those investments. But then at the end of that 10-year lease, they are open to um, some sort of um, reversion to the state of Vermont with either outright or with some additional payment based on, um, you know, our long-term lease and, pro and running the program with them, where they would be able to recoup their cost of that facility. Thank you. Okay, I'll ask again. Are there um, other questions? Um, around the operating budget comparison. Seeing none, uh, Peggy, could you take that down? Appreciate it, thank you. Um, and while we've been asking you uh, questions, uh, Commissioner, already, um, you did give us at our last meeting um, 
the report on the on the long term plan for uh, justice involved youth who need a locked a, um, a, a locked secure facility or placement. Um, I want to open it up to you if you have any summary or further comments and then what questions we have. Um, I, thank you. Yes, um, I would um, comment that we believe a six bed facility um, is the right size uh, for what we're seeing for justice involved youth. Um, I would also point out that right now, um, and this is kind of um, Disability Rights Vermont, AJ Rubin submitted a letter to the committee um, that, was, that, that was provided um, to the committees as well. Um, and in there, he, he references um, a large number of, of youth out of state. And I just want to provide some information to the committee that uh, currently uh, we have 127 youth involved with DCF placed in residential treatment program. Um, 61 of those are in Vermont and 66 of those are outside of Vermont. Um, not all of those are justice involved youth. I would say um, the majority of those are, are children um, coming from the child protection side of the house, not the juvenile justice side of DCF. Um, but we really envision um, developing a more robust system of care throughout Vermont at all different levels. And this proposal is just one piece of that for justice involved youth. Um, we hope to utilize this facility to, to transition um, youth from out of state programs, uh, bring them into Vermont, assess them further, and then transition them to less restrictive um, programming or community-based settings. Um, you know, we acknowledge in the department that um, there's more to be done um, to try to develop uh, resources to keep children stabilized um, at all levels throughout our system of care and that that work is underway and that this piece um, it is, is just one aspect of that, but that this is a critical aspect and, a criti and it's critical at this time, given that Woodside is no longer operating um, that we feel like this is the program that we we want to build, and that it and that it, it is really designed in the building and the programming will really meet the needs of justice involved youth that, in the ways that Woodside has not been able to. Um, Commissioner, let me see if I'm understanding and clear about what you just said. <laughs> One, what you said is that this, um, what I understood you to say was that the universe of youth, the universe of justice involved youth who need a locked facility for a period of time is six. At, at any one time, at, at its peak last year, we had five youth at Woodside at one time. So, I mean, so I just, I mean, I say that because that, that is a, the universe that you are talking about and when AJ comes to, to, to speak and comment, as I read his comments, you're talking about a different universe of youth. So let me um, ask another question. Um, there are many more youth who are in residential placements or other placements, both inside and outside the state. Mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that those um, youth, it is in the judgment of the department and people who work with them um, or correction that they do not need, that the most appropriate response is not a locked facility? Correct. We have children placed in residential treatment programs that have all varying levels of type of security, whether it's staff secure, lower staff secure, you know, or up to the most secure, which is the agreement we have in place um, with the Sununu Center in New Hampshire right now, where for the uh, most secure type facility. Um Are you seeing that that facility um, 
would remain as part of our as part of the state's array um, or is the Beckett proposal um, meant to uh, take the place of that one? Of, of the, the agreement we have currently that we're working with with Sununu, um, we envision that going away, that the Beckett program would serve Vermont youth need that highest level of care. And how many youth are in Sununu now? Uh, we currently do not have any youth placed at Sununu right now. Thank you. Um, so while we have lots of needs for appropriate control, care, and treatment of um, youth and justice-involved youth, what we are talking about right now and what this proposal is and what our task is, is this small number um, or this discrete group of youth who need a uh, locked or, as you are calling it, the most secure placement, which you are saying is at any one given time, six. Yes. Is that yes. right? Yes. Now I think I understand. Can I? Senator Sears either doesn't understand or has more questions. <laughs> I, I think I have a follow-up question too. Actually, um, the eight beds, the four at Depot and the four at the Bennington uh, facility, keep having a hard time with it. The school for girls or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Those eight beds in addition to the six beds at Beckett would be fully replacing what the functions of Woodside were. Is that correct? Did you a justice involved you formerly at Woodside? Yeah, so we, we have been working so with- it's really uh, 14 beds. Yeah, well, we um, expanded um, some of, of those programs capacity to meet some higher level youth um, with, with Woodside closing, um, we certainly would envision like the, uh, the beds at the Vermont School for Girls um, remaining, um, given uh, the Beckett program would only serve uh, young, young men. Um, you know, we would certainly still need those other beds um, at the depot program, but we would probably tr transition them back to uh, the lower level that they had, you know, that historically they've served before. Um, we certainly have a lack of, you know, a need for increasing those level of beds in the state as well. Um, it's one of those areas that we are seeing stress in the system. Of the 66 kids that are out of state, how many of them are in Massachusetts and uh, New Hampshire? Um, I would now, have, do you have that available? I mean, I, I don't need exact numbers. Yeah, I don't have that right at my fingertips tip senator but i certainly can get you that data probably it, it would be helpful yeah. yeah it would be helpful when we discuss out of state placement mm -hmm. we'll look at i believe they're the one in new hampshire are beckett kids is that correct yes um senator i guess i want to um, understand um, whether or not what you are putting forth is an understanding that those are the same type of youth that this very narrow proposal and that what our task. No, no I, I, as the discussion about bringing kids back from out of state, which I think we all would agree with, I wanted to point out that a certain percentage of those kids are in a Beckett program across the river from Vermont, which is fairly close to Vermont in New Hampshire. They used to be in Bennington and then they moved the boys to New Hampshire and kept the girls in Bennington. Then there's a number of kids who are in Massachusetts that actually may be closer to their homes than they would be in Wells River or Newbury. Right. So that was my only point that, that we, when we talk about out-of-state kids, we should um, <clears throat> keep in mind that a, that a large number of that 66 are in um, 
states right next to Vermont. Certainly. So, and if, if I might suggest what you are, what you are reminding us is this is not the end of a conversation. The decision right. we make today. It's a continuation of a long conversation about how to deal with youth that are uh, justice involved or youth that are in the department's custody because of so, so I thank you, Senator. Variety of issues. So we're gonna, so we'll all figure that out. But the universe we're talking about right now in this proposal is a very slice of those youth. So that's, you know, uh, we, we, we keep wanting to do everything, myself included. Um, but I'm trying to keep our eyes on the, well, uh, on this. Yeah, and I, I think what AJ Rubin was pointing out in his letter is that, it, that you can't, that once we make this decision to put this amount of money into that, it has an impact on the rest of the system. So that will be a set, that, that may be a, um, I'll, uh, Representative Emmons, I know you have a question, but before you ask that, um, uh, Commissioner, based on what um, Senator Sears was just um, saying and, and talking about the um, what, uh, AJ has put forth, there is a concern that putting this much money, no matter whether it's 4 million or 5.5 million, that, that will negatively impact um, the other, a larger universe of youth that we will need to um, address down the road or soon. Um, I, I I don't believe that that is the case. I mean, we are, you know, in the state fiscal year 20 budget, we were spending almost $6 million on Woodside and we still had these large, these number of kids in out-of-state placements and in need of other services. And we're meeting those needs. Um, this program that we're, um, six bed program we're, we're uh, working with Beckett to, to create, um, we'll focus on the, our youth that need this higher level of care, which is what Woodside focused on as well. Um, so we'd just be replacing and, and, and providing an enhanced and better service to those youth. Um, I don't disagree with AJ um, that um, the rest of our system of care um, is in need of, of work. Um, and we are uh, committed to that work um, and con continuing to strengthen our in-state system of care. Um, I certainly would love to bring back uh, many of those 66 youth in out-of-state programs. I would also like in general to um, create those community supports so that we don't have uh, such a large number in residential placements, whether in-state or out-of-state. Um, those, those resources take time to develop. Um, and um, I'm interested in focusing on those areas because I think we need to focus on all levels of our system of care and make it as strong as it can be. Um, but right now our most urgent need is this highest level of, of care for justice involved youth that need a uh, secure uh, placement. Thank you. Representative Emmons is very patient. No, that's fine. I just want some clarification in terms of who, who's gonna be there. You're looking with Beck at, at a six bed program uh, no reject, no e eject, correct? Correct. Then you also mentioned you would be using the program for step down for mm -hmm. the juveniles coming in. Is that still within that six bed? Yes, yes. So the six beds would also be used as a step down? It could be, yes. So um, like we had youth who this summer were placed at Woodside, uh, but needed a very uh, um, specialized level of care. And they were moved to treatment programs in other areas of outside of Vermont and other areas of the country. Um, and once those youth uh, reached the end of that treatment, those would be youth that we would wanna transition back to Vermont in a very thoughtful uh, way. And one way we could do that is having this treatment program available um, bring them back to Vermont, assess them, and then arrange to step them down to either a lower level treatment program in the state or to a community-based 
placement like a therapeutic foster home or back with their with their uh, family with increased supports. And so it just gives us some flexibility, this program. So I'm thinking it can also work in the reverse where a youth would really need a more secure, <clears throat> stable situation to become stabilized and then move into another program. Would that work that way as well? Yeah, so we're envisioning this as really as a stabilization program, treatment program, and that we really do wanna limit the length of stays for our justice involved youth. So as you could see in the report, we, our goal is to keep the stays to four months or under. That might not be possible for some DO, uh, DOC involved youth, but in general, we want our goal with this program is to stabilize um, and um, lay the groundwork for those youth to step down to other um, less restrictive uh, treatment settings or programs in, in the state. So then my second question goes to the 3 million or so for the renovations. Mm -hmm. And it's been my understanding that would be coming out of DCF operating budgets for Correct. the renovations. And what would yep. be the process on that? Is that for the FY22 budget or is that budget adjustment for FY21? So in our uh, 20 full year uh, restatement budget for, uh, for state fiscal year 21, um, we um, asked for approximately um, four and a half million dollars um, uh, to continue to support the services for justice involved youth for, for uh, contractual placements, but also set aside approximately 1.2 to 1.4 million dollars of, of for uh, renovations to this program that we were working on with Beckett. And so we already have in our 21 budget approximately $1.4 million available to, to put towards the renovations. And we are working with the, uh, the agency and the administration on, on um, the, the remainder of those funds. And, um, and we do not anticipate seeking a capital bill um, allocation for those funds. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Alice. Um, are there other questions for um, the commissioner either as it relates to the report that we got at the last um, meeting or as you per perused it in between meetings? Um, Representative Pugh? Yes. Sure. Uh, commissioner, uh, you mentioned that this would be the highest level of care. And in, in your report, and from what I've heard, I'm wondering if Beckett has um, engaged in this level of care before, or what happens if uh, you know someone um, is beyond what they uh, have traditionally been uh, dealing with, and currently you know, they can send them to, whether it's Sununu or, or somewhere else, uh, how are they hoping to uh, fit into this, this um, very unique situation? So Beckett is a very experienced uh, provider of this type of, of service, of residential type services, as, as you've heard here uh, today. Um, they operate programs in Vermont, New Hampshire, and in Maine. They employ, uh, you know, literally, I think over a hundred employees just in Vermont alone right now. Um, and as you've heard earlier, one of the programs they operate is the Vermont School for Girls. Uh, they refer to it as the Vermont uh, Permanency Initiative South. That's how uh, the name that Beckett gives it. Um, and they run that program. Um, and they have recently, um, you know, worked with us to uh, provide an, the capability to provide and to treat higher levels of need of young women. And so they're doing that work now, um, but not in a secure building like this program will be. So they do have um, experience serving a higher level of youth, not just, but not in this secure type building that we're proposing in this proposal. Um, okay, we have, um... Thank you. Um, Representative Emmons, you have your hand up. Representative Hooker, you have your hand up. And 
Representative Redman, you have your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a question for the commissioner ar around um, the, the two kind of possibilities that we've been talking about relative to um, Beckett, em Beckett employees running this facility and potentially a hybrid where state employees. And I'm wondering if you have had any conversations with Beckett about that possibility of potentially state employees and whether that's an issue for them, frankly, um, whether they're kind of all in for their um, approach to doing the whole job and not open to this hybrid thing, or if you, you have any clarity on that, that issue from them. We have had high level conversations of, about their willingness and based on those conversations, um, it's my belief that they would not um, 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 be interested in that, but they are still considering the most recent proposal from VSEA. Um, we, we forwarded it to them, and so they are, are in, uh, reviewing it. They've not gotten back to us yet. Um, you know, we do have some concerns uh, with that approach. Um, that's not our proposal. Um, we, you know, not only were there uh, structural issues with the Woodside facility, but there were uh, significant programmatic issues um, when it was run by state employees. Um, you know, we had the federal lawsuit uh, a little over a year ago that then was reopened this past summer as well, based on how youth were being treated in that facility. Um, and we believe um, that our proposal to work with to, uh, an experienced provider like Beckett to provide this uh, program, it will provide a better service to the youth. So uh, we don't support it, but we certainly are working uh, with Beckett to see what their position is on that right now. We've not heard back from them. We hope to soon. Thank you. Um, Senator Hooker, did you mean to have your hand up before? Um, I'm all set. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner, um, based on this last bit, bit of conversation um, where I'm, I have to note and appreciate that while you don't support the proposal from the VSEA that you have passed it on to Beckett, um, I guess I want to ask if Beckett were to say, okay, we, you know, we think that we are fine with hiring individuals and having them be state employees, or we're fine with um, taking who had been, whose job had been at Woodside we're fine with um, hiring them for Beckett. Would the department still be interested in um, contracting with Beckett to provide the service? So I think you put two scenarios um, uh, out there in, in, in your question. One is if they were state employees, and then the other would be if a former employee for Woodside applied to work at the Beckett program. Um, in, in our initial conversations um, with Beckett, they were concerned about the first approach you outlined, but they were open to if there were uh, staff who previously worked at Woodside were interested in working for them, that they would certainly be interested in interviewing them and seeing that they would be a fit for their, for their organization in this program. And becoming and remaining a state employee or becoming be becoming a Beckett employee, uh, uh, the employee of, of their organization. Thank you. Um, Representative Redmond, you have another Just, Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, just a different question relative to the municipality where the facility is located and whether there has been any um, next steps, progress, conversations with uh, municipal officials there about um, this project, perhaps, you know, being in their community. 
In, in my conversations with the, uh, the uh, select board members, um, they certainly are interested in um, engaging with us and having community engagement, just as we are with them. Um, they wanted to take uh, um, the approach that uh, wait for the legislature to weigh in. And if it moved forward past this point, then they would want to start um, more meaningful engagement at that time. And so we are preparing um, now to um, have community forums and, um, and uh, in meetings with the municipal municipal leadership if, if this um, gets the affirmative vote of, of the committees today and then a formal approval at joint fiscal committee. Um, but they felt it was premature um, to bring it forward to the community until there was more certainty that it was moving in that direction. Thank you. More hands went up and I now um, see the case of um, Mike Dempsey. And I didn't know, if, Mike, if you were showing your face because you wanted to say anything. Hi, everybody. My apologies. No, I wasn't. I was just trying to log on. So okay. I apologize for being late. For some reason, this shows up on my calendar for 1230 Central Time. I know you apologize, and I can't hear anything because the planes are going over now. Um, <laughs> Senator Hooker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner, what kind of, what would the oversight um, on the part of the state be on a facility run by Beckett? Um, so uh, as we outlined in our report, um, we have uh, created um, a new position in the commissioner's office um, a clinical director who, who will have more oversight of, of not only this program, but our youth and other, those other 127 youth that are in other placements right now um, that will provide us a greater level of oversight and uh, clinical involvement in, um, in ensuring um, that those youth are getting the treatment um, they need, but also only for the length of time they need so that we can uh, transition children back to other placements or less restrictive settings as soon as um, they're, they're ready in their treatment for that to happen. So, but this wouldn't be someone who was on site or- um... Yeah, this would be a per, this position would, uh, uh, would engage um, with, the, with the Beckett treatment team on a regular basis and would uh, make uh, regular site visits uh, to meet with the youth who are there um, on a regular basis. That's our that's our vision for that position. Thank you. Um, any other questions for the commissioner right now? And commissioner, do you have any final or, or summary comment before other people? Yeah, I, I would just want to expand a little bit on, um, you know, we just spoke previously about whether we supported uh, BSEA's proposal um, uh, to, for this hybrid model. Um, and, you know, and I, and I did give it a lot of thought and as I've indicated, um, we don't support it. Uh, uh, but I'd like to just touch on that a little bit more. Um, one is, in, you know, the, the, the precedent that, that they're putting forth for this type of model uh, was from uh, 1996 when the Department of Corrections started bringing in outside healthcare providers um, to provide health services in the correctional centers. Um, and so, and our understanding is, is based on that agreement uh, that it was a transitional agreement that the positions uh, that were state employees that went and worked under the outside contractor um, uh, only existed until they became vacant and then they and went away. And it's not a model that's in place now. The, uh, my understanding talking with corrections is that um, the vendors of contractors providing health services are all using their own staff and not state employees as contemplated in that 1996 agreement. Um, also, Woodside is closed and through the budget process that closed Woodside earlier this fall, 
uh, all Woodside positions were eliminated. So there are no positions uh, to, 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 um, to do that work right now, even if that was a direction to go in, they don't exist. Um, those staff have gone through the reduction in force process. Many of them are in other uh, positions and doing other work in the agency. Um, and that, you know, Beckett approached us uh, um, with the understanding that they would be running that program and those been the nature of the program that we've put forth. Um, and that proposal leverages, um, you know, their expertise and other programs that are in that general area near Newberry that they run. Um, and that it, it, from our perspective, that would complicate their ability to, to, to leverage different resources and move staff around based on the needs of the youth in that facility at the time. Um, Cause that, you know, just the nature of the, the collective bargaining agreement would really limit our ability to use staff flexibly there and that if they were state employees. Um, and so, um, you know, I, that, I just wanted to touch on those points to kind of frame, to frame some of our concerns. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, uh, next week, oh, we have a question from uh, Senator Lyons. So as you were, um, thank you. Uh, appreciate the thought that you all have put into this. And uh, I do have a question though, as you were considering it and looking at um, state standards and state interests in uh, programming, uh, did that appear to be uh, as a benefit to have the state um, overseeing the programming in a more, uh, perhaps a more rigorous uh, way? In, in which way do you, you mean in terms of having state staff running the program? Yes. Um, you know, some of my, my hesitation is that we, um, you know, you know, we were involved in federal litigation that, that led to a very, um, a settlement agreement. Um, Disability Rights Vermont um, reopened the litigation based on the belief that there were ongoing concerns in the facility um, ongoing and that the closure of that facility and, and um, by the legislature permanently based on the work we were doing to create this um, partnership with Beckett to run uh, the secure residential treatment program in the community as a community-based provider allowed um, Disability Rights Vermont and the state of Vermont to enter into a dismissal. If the state, one of my con other concerns is that if uh, the state of Vermont essentially um, works with Beckett to essentially lease a building and invest in a building, but have state staff run it, that um, you know it could put that federal lawsuit back on the table. Um, and that's concerning to us as well. Uh, I guess my question was not about that, but really about a, a separate issue. And that is a policy oversight of the programming with state employees, putting aside the issue that you've brought up, understanding that, you know, that the lawsuit is the lawsuit. However, in principle, would this, would, state employ would having state employees allow for ongoing uh, oversight and standards for those employees? We believe the contract, the operating contract with Beckett would provide the same level of oversight and confidence that we, in, that we would have in terms of what happens in that facility in terms of programming and policies with the youth just as if it had been a state run facility. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. But I, I guess what kind of analysis did you go through to draw that conclusion? It's somewhat concerning to be honest. Well, Beckett is a very experienced uh, provider. Um, they work very closely um, with our residential licensing unit for the program they operate in Southern Vermont for young women. Um, they are incredibly responsive um, when we make a request in terms of programming or change of policy. Um, they are very quick to respond and work with us on that. And we, 
anticipate that same level of cooperation and partnership in this program as well, uh, based on our history of working with them and their experience here. Um, and so it, it's based on our long-term working with them in various other programs with the youth we place with them in New Hampshire, that they're always very responsive to our requests. And they've been incredibly open um, during our work to develop this program and the initial um, contracting conversations we've had. Um, it gives me great confidence that, um, that we'll be, have that same um, oversight uh, level that we would, whether it was a state-run facility or a contracted facility. Matt, I have a question. If I might. Mm -hmm. Commissioner, um, as a follow-up, with Beckett, have you had complaints about restraints? Um, not specifically to me, but that doesn't mean they haven't occurred in the past. Well, I meant in terms, we know one of the reasons that a number of employees were on paid administrative leave at this veteran's home was the method of restraints that were used, and that was the reason for the um, lawsuit was was partly due to the restraints that were used on, on residents there. Have you had that level of complaint about restraints used by the Beckett, uh, either in New Hampshire or the Beckett School in Bennington? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. Thank you. Okay, thank that, you. That was, uh, that was a point that was made in um, Mr. Rubin's letter, I believe. Um, he and, referenced that. Um, and we will have an opportunity to ask him that yep. um, specifically. Um, he, he's actually um, down, down the, uh, down the list a while. Um, right now we have Marshall Paul, who's the Defender General. Um, hi, Marshall. Good afternoon. Um, so I will just jump in real quick. I really only have two things that I think are important for me to touch on. Um, and then of course, I'm happy to answer any questions. So I really wanna to touch on two issues that have come up uh, in prior testimony. And I wanna preface this by saying that we remain very supportive of the direction that DCF is going with this plan. Um, you know, if you look at the letter that uh, Disability Rights Vermont provided, it identifies a number of concerns. And I think our office agrees that there are, you know, we're gonna have concerns going forward. We're always concerned. Um, but we see them as concerns, not problems. They're things that are going to be important to keep an eye on as this plan progresses and as things are implemented. Um, but what we've really seen through this process is, you know, the, the plan that's been put forward really reflects a lot of thoughtfulness on the part of DCF and a lot of intention to address, uh, you know, the most serious and uh, uh, the most serious and concerning issues that we were confronting at Woodside. Um, so I wanna preface everything by saying we're still very supportive of the plan that DCF has going forward. We are, you know, like Disability Rights Vermont, there's a number of things that are sort of questions that we are looking forward to see how they are answered and looking to see how this plan, sort of the finer points of it develop but we're very comfortable with how the process has gone so far. Um, so two things that have come up in testimony today that I want to address quickly are the issue of out-of-state placements. Um, I think a lot of times there's a perception that out-of-state placements are always a bad thing. Minimizing the number of out-of-state placements is always a good thing. And while I think that there's, you know, our office would agree with that in principle and in general, uh, you know, every, every one of these out-of-state placements really has to be assessed on its own merits. And there's a lot of cases where we would actually much prefer to see a youth who's in custody placed out-of-state than in-state. So, for example, um, a lot of kids who, whose families are on what I would call sort of the east coast of Vermont along the Connecticut River, are, you know, they have a lot more support. They have a lot more family engagement 
when those kids are placed in programs in, in New Hampshire than when they're placed in programs that might be in Bennington or in Burlington, hours and hours away from home. Uh, we see similar situations in the southern part of the state where uh, you know, if there's an appropriate placement just over the border in Massachusetts, that's actually much better than placing a kid in a program in northern Vermont um, because one of the things that we, you know, I think really everybody who's involved in this work has identified is that these kids' success is often very dependent on the engagement of their families, not only sort of just in the process as a whole, but specifically, you know, being able to visit, being able to take part in the case planning process. Um, and that's a really hard thing to do if you have to travel, you know, hours and hours to attend team meetings and things like that. So, you know, while I'm not suggesting by any means that we just sort of broadly support placing kids out of state, I think there's a lot of cases when it makes sense. I would also say, you know, I've represented a lot of kids who have been placed out of state and there's been times when there's really, you know, it wouldn't make sense to have uh, in-state placements for certain kids. So for example, um, you know, I've had kids placed in Texas at adolescent uh, traumatic brain injury centers. We're never gonna have an adolescent traumatic brain injury center in Vermont. Um, you know, we're way too small of a state for that. Honestly, there's only a few of them around the country. And there's a lot of, you know, when we talk about the 60 kids or so that are placed out of state, there's a lot of those kids who are placed in specialized treatment programs like that, that not only is there nothing that's appropriate like that in the state of Vermont, but it also is, you know, practically speaking, impossible to imagine that we would ever develop such a thing in the state of Vermont. Um, and that's okay. I mean, I think that as long as what we are doing is you know, carefully identifying kids who need specialized treatment in out-of-state facilities, getting them the treatment they need out of state, planning carefully to make sure that they are returned as soon as it's clinically appropriate and stepped down through a process that's appropriate, that, you know, that's a, that those can be very appropriate out-of-state placements. So I, I just want to be clear then that the idea that this uh, six bed facility in Newberry should be some sort of solution to placing kids in out of state programs, you know, is that's, that's something we don't agree with. We don't want a locked facility. We don't want kids placed in a locked facility instead of placing them in appropriate out of state placements. Um, it's really much more appropriate that the facility is limited in its use to those kids who present such a security risk that they cannot be in anything besides a locked facility. And that's not the kids, you know, there we're not talking about this population of 60 or so kids who are placed out of state. Um, with the exception of the current contract with the Sununu Center, which really is meant to fill that high security need and which would hopefully that contract would evaporate then once this six bed highly secure facility was stood up. The other topic I just wanted to touch on briefly was the topic of oversight of the facility. Um, and DCF, I think uh, Commissioner Brown addressed from DCF's perspective that they would uh, plan to have people there on site on a regular basis monitoring what goes on there. And I just also wanted to touch on the fact that our office, you know, when Woodside was in operation, when there was kids in Woodside, we would be there twice a week in the facility talking to the kids, talking to all of the new intakes, talking to the kids who were there, who were you know, preparing the transition out, talking to kids who were there, who had issues around conditions of confinement or uh, other problems that had developed while they were in the facility. And we would intend to do exactly the same thing um, at the six bed facility uh, if and when it stood up in, in Newbury. Um, so I just wanted to be clear that you know, we don't see this as really diminishing our capacity for oversight and um, oversight and uh, sort of supervision of what's going on there and knowing what's going on with the kids in the facility. Um, we're quite confident that we would be able to provide the same level of oversight and responsiveness to our clients uh, in the Newberry facility as we would at Woodside. 
and that's all I have to say. Other than that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall. And let me uh, look and see if any uh, representative uh, Hooper. Thank you. Um, Marshall, the question that you just addressed is one that I want us to fully understand. I think an element of wondering if this should be a state employee staffed facility is part of the questioning would we have better insight into the quality, the, the care of the individuals in our custody. And what I just heard you say is that you would be providing the same um, level of assuring that those kids have a voice and access to counsel, et cetera, in this facility as they would in a state-run facility. Um, uh, and this is, is much probably a question for the commissioner, but I would want to assure that and if we entered into a contract with Beckett for this, that they acknowledge that in, indeed you have, the, the Defender General's office has a right to enter, provide services to those kids and have access to records so that you can have good, a good view into what their needs are. Does, does that make sense? I mean, do, do we need a kind of a, an additional contractual statement about yes, the DG's office can and other attorneys representing those kids have access both to the kids and to records? Um, Certainly, I don't think it ever hurts to have that explicitly spelled out in contractual terms or in statute. I would also say though that we're very confident that we would get it whether it's in statute or not because it's a constitutional issue um you know the kids who would be in this facility would only be kids who are charged with or can, uh, have been adjudicated of having committed a delinquent act which means that under the sixth amendment they are entitled to counsel and um we would and have in the past ensured that kids sixth amendment rights are protected whether or not that is clearly spelled out in any sort of policy or contract or not, um, we, would, we would get it. Um, that said, we would be very happy to have it spelled out explicitly, either in contract or statute, just to be sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, my confidence, though, is, comes from the fact that you know, we've litigated these issues in the past. It's clear that, these, that this population of kids would have your right to access to counsel. And if we were in a situation where we felt that kids were being denied that right, we would litigate and we would, you know, protect that right through the court system if necessary. Yeah. It's and, and, and if I may ju just jump in here, uh, yes, that will be a part of the contract access for uh, the child's attorney, but also um, making it clear that um, disability rights Vermont and their attorneys and staff will have access uh, not only to the youth, but to their records and their treatment team as well. Um, and in our conversations with Beckett, um, not not only do they understand that, but they actually welcome that that level of, of oversight and participation in their program as well. And so we don't foresee that being an issue, but it will be included um, in the contract. And to that point, um, we've actually already invited disability rights and their staff to, to participate in our work with Beckett in developing this in, in the program and uh, the facility enhancements um, already. And so um, we, we welcome their participation. Okay, thank you. Just a quick follow up on that is, um, you know, another thing to mention is we have a lot of familiarity with uh, representing kids who are in Beckett programs. And, you know, Beckett has, for the most part, been very open to working with our attorneys and working with our office through the case planning process. And, you know, we have, you know, the, the pandemic has definitely changed sort of how we operate. But in the normal world where we're not, you know, pr prior to the pandemic, you know, we, we very frequently had representatives, representatives of our office visiting kids at Beckett facilities. Uh, meeting with Beckett staff, participating in treatment team meetings, in case planning meetings, 
Um, and we've been very comfortable with the level of support and the level of cooperation that we've had from Beckett over the years. Okay, thank you. That's terrific to hear. I had understood that unlike the adult population, that there has, where the DG's office has an unfettered right to records, that, that is, there, there's a different statute controlling the juvenile and that you have had in the past to subpoena records in order to have access to them. And I just wanna make sure we're not, that th this is not a barrier. That's true. Um, it, it, that those problems, that honestly, have revolved around Woodside, not around private programs. Huh. Huh. Um, okay. There you go. So, so yes. I mean, I think that you know. I think just to be, just to clarify for the rest of the committee, uh, what Representative Hooper is talking about in the in the public defender statutes regarding the Prisoners' Rights Office. There's a statute that provides that the Prisoners' Rights Office has pretty much unfettered access to uh, communicate with DOC staff and to inspect DOC records. And there's no similar provision for the juvenile defender's office. Typically when we uh, need those, need access to those kind of records, we get it through the legal process if we need to go through that. Um, and it certainly would be helpful to us to have a statute like that in place, we, you know, that would that would make our, our, our work easier. Um, but to the extent that we've had that problem in the past, it's generally revolved around Woodside, not around private providers. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you, Mary. You sort of got us um, into um, a discussion perhaps that is more in terms of if we decide to approve this, um, are there conditions or are there um, pieces that we want to attach to that approval? Um, if there are no other questions for Marshall, um, we have James Pepper from the state's attorney and sheriff's office. Hi, James. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. James Pepper from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Um, I don't have too much to add uh, here. Um, you know, we're our department is somewhat tangential to some of these questions that we've been talking about today around staffing. I would reiterate our support for the DCF proposal. Um, you know, I think I mentioned in the past that the state's attorneys see a need for a small facility that is no eject, no reject, um, that's located within the state, that's building secure, um, and that is right sized for the population that we've been seeing trending over the last few years. We think you know somewhere between five and ten beds. This being six, is the right size. Um, I want to thank, of course, all of the placements that have stepped up um, since Woodside has effectively closed. Um, you know they've had to change their programming. They've taken on uh, justice-involved youth that are um, probably beyond what they have in the past. Um, but I think you know as every day goes on, we see a need for a facility like the one being proposed in Newberry. Um, and so we're very supportive um, of the DCF proposal. And, you know, that's just where we are. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions, uh, just recognizing kind of that we're somewhat tangential to the some of the questions that are being discussed today. Uh, Thank you, James. Um, uh, Senator Sears, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I'll start with a couple of questions. I've had concerns expressed about kids who are um, left in police stations um, who have been uh, charged or have been picked up, who are over, who are. Um, there hasn't been able, and since you're representing the sheriffs too, evidently there's been problems transporting kids. Um, and I'm curious to know if, how kids would, would it, going to Newberry, I, I am I actually, no, I don't know if I've ever been to Newberry. I think I've been to Wells River, but I don't think I've ever been to Newberry. Um, is that gonna be a difficult 
task for sheriffs and others to get to as they transport kids around the state? And about um, kids, um, about current problems with kids who are charged or arrested being left in police station. Well, I think uh, with respect to that second part that the this facility could serve as an alternative to certainly being, you know, left at a police station overnight, or um, I think that this this facility would offer some flexibility to DCF, which really currently has to scramble um, to find a bed from time to time. And having um, a six bed secure facility would fill some of that need when it's necessary. The transport question, um, you know, the, the system that we have right now is, I wouldn't call it voluntary uh, with respect to how the sheriffs respond, but, um, you know, they, uh, they don't always have the resources at their fingertips to transport folks when they need to be transported. And, you know, I think that's more of a, I don't know if it's a contracting issue with DCF, um, but uh, I, I don't know how much I can really speak to the transport issue from, uh, from the state's attorneys, from the department's perspective. Well, to me, it's an important issue. And, uh, and if you're a kid from who's picked up in Bennington, for example, um, going to Woodside is, is a three hour trip each yeah. way. Um, I don't know how long it takes to get to Wells River, but I think it's going to exasperate the situation that's already something that we need to look at, and that's sheriff's transportation of particularly these uh, juveniles who are justice-involved juveniles. Um, I heard of a case in Franklin County where a kid was left for, I believe, 19 hours in the police station. And they only had one other person on duty at night in that community. And so the, they had two people total and one of them had to stay with that youth because they couldn't arrange transport to wherever they were gonna transport. I think it was actually to Bennington. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I guess one of the benefits of what DCF has done over the past couple of years is they've built up the capacity and some of these uh, other placements that, you know, I think, you know, if you have, if this, you know, the depot street was, I think, able to offer a bed, um, but it came down to a transport issue. But now if we have, you know, another, another option around the state, it'll just give some more geographic coverage. Um, but I, I agree with you on the transport issue. And if I could uh, jump in, Senator, we, you know, that was an unfortunate situation. Um, where we weren't able to, uh, through the normal processes that we use in terms of um, uh, contacting the dispatches for the sheriffs across the state. Uh, but we are working with the sheriff's departments now and we believe um, we have a path forward to ensure that um, if we encounter that situation again, that we have a process in place to escalate it uh, higher up um, through the sheriff's department's hierarchy um, and we believe that that will allow us to, to arrange for transport in a similar situation in the future, because we agree that that's not a tenable uh, solution. And it was unfortunate that it happened um, in that case. Um, but we are working to make sure that we have safeguards in place so it doesn't happen again. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. Mm -hmm. do, we, do we have other questions? James, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, next, I would um, ask uh, 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 um, Brian uh, Grierson, who's our Chief Superior Court Justice. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for the record, Brian Grierson, uh, Chief Superior Judge. And I don't, uh, I don't believe I can add. Um, a lot to the conversations taking place this afternoon, other than to reiterate that our experience has shown over the last few years um, that there is a need for a, a secure facility. Um, but I would agree with uh, Commissioner Brown's comments, as well as some of the other witnesses, that th the size uh, that's being proposed here seems 
right, at least from what we're seeing uh, from our, our perspective. Um, the numbers have not been large over the last few years, and this seems to seems to be the the uh, correct correct number. Um, I, I would also uh, echo uh, Marshall's comments about the need for out of state placements. Um, it is not necessarily a bad thing. It, it depends on the individual case before us, and there certainly are uh, programs that are not available in Vermont that um, that are offered in other states. And certainly we don't want to uh, place a child in a locked facility uh, because it's in Vermont as opposed to getting the, the treatment they need perhaps in another state. So that, that will always be an issue for the for the courts. But we recognize the need for this facility. Um, and it's interesting uh, in listening to the commissioner uh, because at the last uh, hearing, uh, Senator Sears asked um, me to check with the judges on how many um, youth had been sent to the Sununu Center. And consistent with what the commissioner had said earlier this afternoon, there are no um, Vermont youth in the Sununu Center. And in fact, uh, none of the judges who responded to me um, indicated they'd ever sent someone there. And there was even one or two who wasn't even aware that it was, didn't know what the Sununu Center was. So I, I think um, that speaks to, um, speaks to a lot of the issues that are before this committee, um, particularly in terms of the, of, the, of the size of the facility we're, uh, you're considering. Um, so I, I don't uh, I don't have anything new to add to my testimony from the last time, but I'm certainly glad to answer any questions that the committee members may have. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Gerson. Uh, do we have questions for him? Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and committee, we have two more uh, witnesses on our schedule. Um, next, we have Steve Howard from the BSEA. And our final witness um, that is on the agenda is AJ Rubin from Disability Rights. Um, Steve. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to testify. Um, this is a very big decision that you have today, that the legislature has before it. Uh, I just wanna make a few points. Many people have seen, I think, the emails that uh, we sent on behalf of our members. So I won't, I won't, uh, I won't uh, uh, belabor those points, but I just wanna say that as you consider this privatization contract, it's, it's really important to remember that privatization in general uh, leads to the loss of control. It generally leads to the exploitation of workers. Generally, those workers are often those workers are women, um, and it often leads to higher costs for the state. This is a big decision. Uh, the taxpayers of the state of Vermont are about to send a private out-of-state corporation $3 million to renovate a building they don't own. Uh, they will also hold all the cards down the road uh, in terms of the operating costs of that facility. Um, I'm not as bothered by what Beckett thinks about whether or not uh, the employees who work there should be state employees. I don't really think that should matter. Uh, they certainly are happy to take our money, um, but it shouldn't be a one-way street where they get all the money, but none of the accountability. And that's what state employees really offer. They offer the legislature and they offer the families, they offer these kids, they offer the taxpayers of the state of Vermont uh, really the kind of oversight that attorneys who occasionally visit and the DCF officers who occasionally leave Waterbury and occasionally visit can offer. Um, these workers, just like the workers at Woodside, are often the only family these kids have. And they will be there every single day, 24 hours a day. Uh, the only way they can freely speak up without threat of losing their job is if they have the protection of a union contract. And really, if they have the, the only way the legislature is going to get real information 
uh, not the information that DCF chooses to give the legislature, but real information about what's happening on the ground is if these workers have a union to go to and the protections that those that that union provides them. We often, and I know many of you know this, bring information to the legislature that the administration didn't want the legislature to know. So uh, the real accountability for a private corporation that's taking millions of dollars to the state is to have the hybrid model and to give the, these union, these, these workers a union contract. Um, you know, I'm, I, the commissioner talks about the lawsuit. There's no reason why a brand new program with a, with a union contract would start a lawsuit over again. The commissioner can hire anybody he wants for these positions. And in fact, he hired all of the workers. DCF hired all of the workers who worked at, at Woodside, especially the management. Um, they should be held accountable for that. Um, but there's no reason there's no, no, no reason to throw that around other than to scare you and to distract you from the kind of accountability and oversight that unionized workers uh, would be able to provide you. The bottom line here really is if we're gonna stand up a strong program for these kids, we need to have the best and the brightest working there. You know, Beckett has never done this work before. Uh, the employees at Woodside stabilized our, our justice involved youth and sent them to Beckett and sent them out to the communities and then took them back when Beckett couldn't manage them. So if they're willing to try this, then at least we should make sure that those employees who work there have, um, are, are attracted to positions uh, for which they're well compensated and for which they're, they, they are well um, protected. The bottom line here is are we going to stand by the workers or are we going to allow them, allow the administration to privatize and exploit them? That's the view of the VSEA. We hope that when you decide this, this, this uh, make this decision, it won't just be about, it won't just be about the numbers and the charts and the graphs, but it'll be about, it will be about the um, uh, support you're giving the people who are going to be hands on every day of the week uh, with these kids who have already been traumatized enough. There's no, there's no way, uh, there's no way that you can substitute for attracting the best and the brightest and having them stay and be retained in positions for which they are well compensated and for which they can be, they can make a career out of the work they do. Don't allow them to do this on the backs of the workers. Fine, if you want to privatize it, if you don't want to be part of the management anymore, that's one thing. But protect the workers uh, who are taking care of these kids and protect this legislature and future legislatures from being shut out and, and left in the dark. Make sure you have 24 seven eyes, eyes on the program. That's the only, only way you'll really know what's going on there. And that could only come with the hybrid model. So we hope that you will put aside whether or not Beckett cares, whether or not Beckett wants the hybrid model and do what you want and do what you want to do for workers. They'll take the money and they'll find a way to work with it. They, that's the way every state manager uh, operates. It's not the end of the world. Uh, it, it's, it's just a level of accountability that of course they don't like, but that they should have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve, and I want to turn it to members of the committee for uh, questions. Senator Sears. Well, I guess I'll jump in where wise men fear to tread. Um, the uh, relationship, my experience has been fairly positive for the most part with the relationship between state employees and the veterans home. Although in prior administrations, there were significant problems between management and um, the employees. Um, a lot of it driven um, by 
because the board of trustees is basically in charge of the veterans home. And in this case, Beckett would be in charge of the program. So do you, do you see that as a problem in trying to, um, uh, I think what one improvement we made was, uh, and the trustees made at the veterans home was putting a member of the staff on the board of trustees. Do you see, and I know you've been involved with the veterans home, uh, do you see um, any problems there? Thank you, Senator. No, I don't. And I think that's a great model. I mean, we have certainly our differences with the management of the veterans home, just as we would, I'm sure, with the management of, of Beckett. Um, but the fact that um, a state senator knows about what's going on every day at the veterans home is not because the management there has uh, made it clear to, to the legislature what's going on. It's because this union and the workers in the, at the veterans home had a place to go to say, this is what's happening that needs to be addressed. This is, this, is what's, this is what you don't know. This is what they're not telling you. So I don't know why we would want to limit our ability to get more information to the legislature and to the public, uh, which is what I think the union does at the vets home um, and what, the, what uh, I think we can do here. Incidentally, I, I wanna say the veterans home uh, recently received an award uh, from the from CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, for their ability to retain staff. Uh, people make a career out of working at the Vermont Veterans Home in a way they don't in any privatized facility. Why is that? They have a union, they have a contract, they have a retirement plan, they have a health care plan, and that is what we're really deciding here. Are we going? Are we going to give these kids? Uh, a chance with workers who are uh, paid whatever a private corporation decides to pay them, or are we going to give them an opportunity um, uh, to work with people who can make a career out of the work they do? Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Senator. Uh, are there other <clears throat> questions or comments directed at Steve from the VSEA's comments. Steve, thank you very much. Um, as usual, you've been very, your, your state employees should be pleased at how strongly you support them. Um, our, <clears throat> the final uh, witness who is on the uh, agenda is A.J. Rubin from Disability Rights. Good afternoon, A.J. Good afternoon, um, A.J. Rubin from Disability Rights. For the record, I have to say a, a big thank you to everyone on the on the call today on, as a meeting. It's been a long meeting, a lot to talk about. You almost be tired, so I definitely want to move as quickly as possible. Um, I'd also like to just commend um, really everybody who's been involved in the process of uh, thinking about what should happen after Woodside for, the, for these kids. Um, uh, Commissioner Brown and his staff have been exceedingly open with us. Uh, we communicate regularly and, um, and um, they're a good collaborative partner. Uh, we may have different ideas about what should go forward, but we are definitely um, glad to work with, with, uh, with them um, and are committed to be a good partner with them. Um, and frankly, the union too, if they are, if they are still involved in this program. Um, I want to apologize for the typographical errors on our written submission. Um, there were a couple in there and I, I try hard not to do that. Um, the most important thing I want to uh, uh, put in your minds um, are, are um, two main things. One is most people who testified today agreed that there is a need for more community supports uh, and more less restrictive placements in Vermont. Um, that's everyone agrees with that. Uh, secondly is um, I really think we have to talk about uh, how many children, uh, boys, have been placed in locked secure facilities for more than a couple of days since Woodside stopped taking new children, which was really in July or August of, of, of last year. Um, I, I think it's uh, quite a lot less than six uh, have been in these locked facilities. Um, and um, lastly, I wanna be make it really clear that Woodside, despite the legislator's effort and the um, the hyperbole about it was not a no eject reject facility. Um, it was absolutely true that if you were um, psychiatrically uh, acute, 
you would go to a hospital. Uh, it was also um, true that if you were a DOC kid and the director of the program thought you were too disruptive, they could send you back to DOC where they would you know, house you either in a, a separate facility, separate unit of Marble Valley or in a hotel room with two guards. I um, mean, that happened and that came out during our federal litigation. So when we talk about this new place being an eject reject facility, uh, to be clear, if the child has psychiatric emergency needs, they, they should not be kept there. Um, and that was something that got DCF in trouble in, with the federal judge was holding kids um, who should be in a different program. Um, last thing I wanna say is my concern is that we're still gonna have the problem of moving kids out of this facility. What I heard the commissioner say is it might be a place to put kids who need short-term detention before they go to a new place or a step down for kids coming in of out of state before they go to a new place. My, my concern is, and what our report wrongly confined shows is that there's a dearth of places to put people when they're ready to go. And, and our big concern is this will just be another place where people get held up. Um, in any event, we're happy to work with, uh, with everyone involved um, uh, to try and make it a safe, uh, a safe place and to increase our, our ability to not institutionalize anybody, children included, if it's not absolutely necessary. So that's all I have to say. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you, AJ. Um, again, I wanna open it up to any of the legislators. I might, if I might. Um, yeah, please. One of the things that Woodside had, I, I, somebody asked me yesterday when it was first opened, and I was thinking sometime in the early 80s, but I'm not sure. So the physical building itself uh, was antiquated. But I think you would agree um, that it was partly management that uh, led this down this path um, that had been um, even teaching restraints that weren't appropriate. Uh, and I don't know how much of that you were um, involved in um, during your, with the courts and as they looked at the management. I know there were a number of employees who were um, dealt with, but how much of that had to do with the management and the techniques that were employed in discipline? Uh, well, well, um, thank you, Senator. Like, like you, I have a long history with Woodside. I was a public defender in Rutland um, back in the early, late 80s, early 90s, and we sent children up there. And then since I've been at the RBT, we've been in there a lot. We've, um, you know, what I wanna say about that is the, the use of force system was wrong uh, and management um, and staff, really everyone should have identified that. But, more importantly was um, the kinds of kids who were there. I, I absolutely agree with Steve Howard that the staff there did remarkably good work over a long period of time with many children. The problem was that there was a group of children, mostly with serious mental health problems, but they weren't acute enough to be inpatient uh -huh. psych uh, residents that, um, that the staff were ill-equipped to deal with. And they wound up using you know, what we consider to be inappropriate uses of force and restraint because these children really were beyond their level of, of ability to care for. They did not have um, the right type of, of on-site clinical work. And one of our concerns with the Beckett proposal is the DCF sort of clinical oversight will be done by a master's level uh, person, not a PhD level person, which is part of our federal uh, lawsuit uh, uh, settlement agreement, which of course that case is dismissed and it's, it's a dismissed but, case. But we, would you agree we still don't have a solution for that group? So, you know, what I want to say about that is that that is the hardest group and uh, of people to well, work I agree. With, not just adults, but kids, and that there's no one really has a, a, a good idea. But what's, what I think is worth looking at and why my thinking on this has evolved over time is that since last <clears throat> basically shut down new children going into Woodside. We've scrambled, as, as uh, James Pepper said, we've scrambled to do something else, something better than Woodside. And we've succeeded time and again. And it's been a hard effort during the pandemic. Oy, it's been really hard, but we've done it. 
And, and to my mind, what it says is that if we really put resources and energy into keeping kids in the community and limiting their, the time that they're in locked facilities, we can actually do that most of the time, almost 90% of the time. The problem but, with the facility, so that's my thought. But, but as a follow-up, if I might, Please do. that group of kids is still out there, I assume, um, that didn't change. It may even be worse during the pandemic for those kids with acute problems. Where are they? Are they at the Brattleboro Retreat? Are they, I mean, that's the key. If those same kids end up in the wrong program, you have that problem. Um, whether it be Beckett or 204 or uh, Bennington School for Girls, wherever it is. But where are those children with acute psychiatric trauma or acute psychiatric problems? So, so I absolutely agree. And, and again, we're talking about this small group of kids, and there's a group of adults like this too, but we're not talking about them. Right. You know, it's the rising tide was Well, this off. is the Child Protection Committee, so. Right. So, but, but so, um, so, so these are kids who would not be admitted to a hospital, like the Brattleboro Retreat for the hospital section of the retreat, because they're not Basically, medication is not going to fix them so much. They really need deep trauma-informed care. And, and what I haven't heard, and I haven't been able to get this information any, anywhere, is what, what is happening with those kids. I, I've heard anecdotally, like you have, Senator, that some of these kids are being held in police departments for a day or two. And of course, that's bad. And I've heard anecdotally that you know some kids are being sent out of state. Um, but that's not a crisis placement. That's a, that's a temporary placement. And so it begs the question before we invest in a locked facility, which again, I wanted to say, having kids in a locked facility for three or four months is, is pretty rough. It's pretty harsh. And how many of our kids right now need that long-term locked facility? That's and short or short-term, what is happening with these kids? And this issue about it being far away and the transport being an issue, that, that's actually very uh, crucial not in terms just of the sheriffs, but also of anybody going to visit. You know, the Defender General's office does yeoman's work in protecting these kids, but it's gonna be a lot harder to get to Newberry than it is, or Newfane, than it is to get to Newberry. So, um, um, AJ, if I can um, ask, and then we have, two, um, we have <clears throat> two or three other people who would have questions. In hearing you talk, um, is it fair to say that you don't support either um, a Beckett facility or um, the hybrid with state employees in Beckett or with a um, sta state of Vermont um, operated equivalent. Because that, uh, that is putting money into a locked facility. And what I'm hearing you say is that um, there's, so you don't support anything that's on the table. So I, I want to be really clear, as I said at the beginning, everyone has worked really hard on this and a lot of very smart people have looked at it. And so my, our position from DRBT is that we're trying to raise questions and we have concerns. We're not gonna support one side or the other or, or anything, but, but systemically, we believe that the more locked institutions you build, the more you will use them and that will necessarily take away resources from what works to prevent the need in the first place. And I think looking at the data would be useful for all of you, but I, I, I can't take a position one way or the other and I apologize. No, that. that's that's that, that's fine. I appreciate the, the clarity. Um, we have three people who have their hands up. We have Senator Lyons, Representative Hooper and Representative Redman. Um, so we'll go in that order because that's how it appeared to me. Senator Lyons. Uh, thank you. And thank you very much, AJ, for your testimony and your, uh, the information that you've provided uh, in, in writing. I haven't found the uh, misspellings yet, so I'll keep looking. <laughs> um, so first, just a comment first, and that is that we know that our facilities and our environment very much influence our behavior, whether we are professionals or kids, adults, that, that it doesn't matter whether it's your home or a secure facility. Um, we also know from our, the information that we've received that a home-like environment 
uh, for children is beneficial. So it doesn't look like uh, an institutional setting. It looks more friendly. So I think we've heard that that is something that is going to happen. Now, having said that, I am very much taken by your comments on the mental health treatment opportunities for these kids, as well as the need for a PhD clinical psychologist to provide services um, for these kids. And I, I really, I have to say, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> so, it gets to the question, if we have, uh, we, we probably do need some kind of a secure facility. We can't get around that. Well, I remember when Woodside was built, I remember the conditions that uh, caused it to be built. It was very concerning. Uh, I had family mem members of the same age as the young woman who was killed. And um, so I think, uh, having a secure facility and some treatment uh, is programs is important. Uh, uh, my question for you, I guess, is, you know, <laughs> which, which comes first here? Um, the, the treatment programs, should we be focusing in on the clinical psychology side of this? Should we focus in on the secure facility? Uh, or, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we proceed, given that you're, um, uh, you're, you're apparently agnostic, but uh, trying to get some definitive information? So I, I, pre I appreciate your, your comments. I am trying to maintain, you know, um, that agnosticism. We will be here to work with whatever happens. I, you know, I can... Pr I can um, my feeling is that the numbers show that at any given time, there's zero to two youth who need to be in a locked facility for a few days. So it's not really six. At any time there's you know, zero to two and they could be anywhere in the state. And that because there's a lack of, of, of placement for people with these sort of personality disorders, not, um, psychiatric mental illness, but uh, it's hard to find placements for them. Um, and so they get stuck. Um, and so, you know, I can foresee having a North and South, you know, two bed facility that's staffed sort of by a team of a nurse, uh, a, a high level mental health worker and, and, uh, and someone with some security professional, you know, uh, ability, but plain clothes if it's, you know, for safety. Um, kind of what they're doing in Hyde Park, the yellow house that, that DMH has been using. Um, I can see like a small two, you know, two unit thing here and there in the state. What I, what I guess I'm, I'm concerned about is this idea that there's gonna be a program that's gonna be locked for kids to be in for three or four months. And, it, and it's not clear to me that that's a specialized program. We talked that, about not being, you know, from out of, it's not gonna take kids from out of state placement and put them here, but, but there aren't five or six kids right now in locked programs that we would move into this place, I don't think. Um, what there is is a need for the police to take someone who murdered their you know, family members, take them someplace quickly and hold them for three or four days with mental health treatment. But we may not need a six bed facility. You know, and remember that Woodside was a 30 bed facility that cost $6 million a year to operate. And, and when I were talking about a six bed facility, it's gonna cost, I'm not sure how much a year, but, but a considerable amount. But again, we, but a lot of people have been thinking about this. I think what's new to me is that over the last six months, what we've seen is that there hasn't been a need to lock kids up for months and months of time. And there really hasn't been you know, a half a dozen kids at any one point locked up. AJ, thank you. Thank you for the clarity with which you keep saying that. Um, Representative Hooper and then Representative Redmond. You have questions for AJ. Um, I'm not sure I have questions for AJ, but an observation about where we are. Um, first of all, I can perhaps- I'm sorry, Mary, Mary, hold on. If this, is, if this is a discussion, let's give um, <clears throat> members the opportunity to ask questions okay. of Abe before we move to discussion. Certainly, that, thank you. Yep. Uh, Mary Beth, is yours a question? 
Uh, yeah, just a, a question about the um, the PhD level clinical director uh, that caught my eye as well in the report. And um, I just wondered if you could elaborate on that, like why you think that's so important. Right. So um, I appreciate the, the uh, um, comment, uh, um, Representative. So in our settlement agreement, one of the, the um, uh, um, issues was the clinical oversight. And we had been concerned that the people who were doing clinical oversight, um, you know, were allowing stuff to happen that wasn't appropriate. So as part of an agreement for, for us to keep the, the facility running, Woodside running, and to, and to settle our lawsuit, we required and the state agreed that they would hire a permanent director of the program who would have at least a PhD level of, of, uh, of clinical um, uh, academic uh, success. Um, and um, that was impossible because that sort of level of knowledge and professionalism would be necessary to sort of overcome the security, you know, uh, the, the force of the security aspect of the facility, as well as to work with medical doctors on a rel relatively equal basis. And we found that someone who didn't have that level of, of authority wouldn't be able to make sure that the therapeutic outcomes occurred. And what I understand is that Beckett may have their own clinical management, but that the person at DCF who's going to be in charge of not just making sure that the six kids at this Beckett program are being treated appropriately, but also the 66 kids who are out of state and the other kids who are in state, that one person is not going to be a PhD level person. Um, and and um, that is different than what we had agreed to early. But again, our case is dismissed and we can't force that on anyone, but it is a sort of a, a, diminution, a diminution of the level of authority that was involved. And, and if I could just clarify, so uh, the treatment program and, and um, that's the preliminary program as described in the report we submitted, um, prepared by Beckett, um, was prepared uh, by their vice president, uh, Laura Colburn, who's a PhD psychologist. Um, she's involved in the design of the program and they will have a PhD clinical person overseeing the delivery of services in, in the Beckett program. Um, the, the, the clinical position within the commissioner's office is, is a position that doesn't exist, hasn't existed. And this is just for the commissioner's office to have some level of oversight over our kids across. That, that wasn't implicated um, in, in the federal lawsuit. That was in terms of the treatment being provided at Woodside. This is more of an oversight function. And I certainly appreciate AJ's um, perspective on this. And I'm cer certainly happy to continue that conversation with him because um, I, I certainly understand his concerns, but but we're really talking about two different positions with two different functions. And I just want to be clear about that, that there will be PhD involvement in the development of the program at Beckett and the delivery and, and on-site delivery of those uh, services at Beckett. This other position is something that a capacity we didn't have within the commissioner's office of DCF and that it will be new. And so that role will evolve over time as well because it will be a new function and a, a new um, oversight role that we just didn't have before here. And so it will be a work in progress and evolve over time as well. So. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Mar uh, Mary Beth, did you get your question? As yes, I'm, okay. I'm all set. Thank you. Um, I, <clears throat> does anyone else have a question? Um, for AJ, then I'm going to turn it back to Mayor, uh, Representative Hooper, who I asked to hold her themes. So, do you want? Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I was um, waiting out the silence. It's a social work skill. Yes. <laughs> One that I am not good at. In fact, I rush in usually. Um, so I think we are thinking about the decision about do we engage with Beckett or not as kind of the end process. And I do not believe that is what we're looking at. Um, I think this is just an, a, another step in the evolution of how we provide services to a particular group of kids. What has, not knowing anything about the juvenile world, um, but having spent a wee bit of time on kind of the adult world and trying to understand the services that are provided there, 
I am struck with the similarities of, of the need for a vast array of ever evolving services to meet the particular needs of the community at the time, rather than saying, we'll build a facility and that solves the problem. Um, to me, uh, if we agree to go with what Beckett is proposing, I think we need to then continue looking down the road and understanding what else is needed out there. I, I never wanted on the adult, not more on the mental health side, I have always been concerned about the number of higher level, more secure beds that we're building, believing that these services, if we spent the same amount of money in the community, we would be reducing the need for those higher cost services. That, I believe it's the same case with, with kids, not knowing that world, but that just strikes me as it's gotta be the case. Um, I'm a little bit concerned with the thought that we, given where we are today, um, we only need beds of this nature on the order of about six. I think these are extraordinary circumstances DCF has probably knocked itself out to find alternatives. So I'm a little bit worried about what the right number is, but we've got to make a decision. This seems to be, uh, there seems to be an evolving consensus around let's do that, <clears throat> but let's don't stop thinking there. And I would think that one of our recommendations should also be that there continues to be a process that not only that doesn't look just at DCF, but these are kids who are served by the Department of Mental Health. Sometimes there's shared custody there. Um, the Agency of Education certainly has a role here that is significant and important. And frankly, I'm concerned about how they are funding and willing to engage with Success Beyond Six <laughs> and the mental health services. So we need to be looking at this from a, a cross-cutting point of view, not just justice-involved kids. We need to be building a system. But in the meantime, um, as a temporary solution for the next several years, it looks to me that Beckett is meeting the needs that we see there for, for kids. And it makes sense to me to go in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, if I <clears throat> sort of hear part of what you are saying, it gets me back to the very beginning at 1230 when Senator Sears and I were sort of having a bit of a, a, a conversation that um, we have a decision here, um, but that will not stop the conversation around um, other other youth or what we're going to continue to do to treat this population as, um, as the needs and science change. Um, thank you, Mary. Uh, well, I think the- Senator well, Sears. Yeah, I, I think the, <clears throat> I share the concern of those that have expressed is six too many, is six enough. Um, there's always been a small group of young people um, who have needed a facility such as Woodside. <clears throat> um, my experience has been it's a small number and is, is six too many is, I think six is more than enough, but there is that small group. There's also the kids who are under D DOC custody who've committed one of the big 12 crimes that could even involve murder or other very serious offenses that I think um, you would, uh, many of those kids need to be held at least short term in a facility that can handle them. My, my concern is that, um, and I don't, I don't have any qualms about voting to recommend that we go along with the proposal from DCF to contract with Beckett. 
my big concern is will Beckett be able to handle this population? Um, and it is, you know, having been in the business myself, um, it's an ex some of those kids are extremely difficult. Um, and uh, we should never underestimate the difficulties. And I, I share the concern about making sure that there's oversight from some um, in a clinical nature. Um, I'm a little concerned about that. I share A.J. Rubin's concern there as well. But I, I, I don't have any doubt that there's a need for a small number. And Senator Sears, I'm smiling as you talk because um, you in the southern part of the state ran a residential facility. Yep. Um, and around the same time, I was in the northern part of the state working in a residential treatment center. So we both sort of bring our history to this, yep. um, which can be a help or can also you know, be, have to make sure that we don't get stuck in that, or at least I need to make sure I don't. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, we see, um, uh, I see some hands up. Um, I, I do want to, as people are beginning to, to um, speak, I think it's important to sort of say where they are, um, both, both Dick and um, both Senator Shears and Representative. Um, Hooper have um, sort of said that um, there's a growing consensus moving towards the Beckett proposal. And then um, both of them, Senator Sears, last and sort of needing to have something around oversight um, as part of the condition. Um, I see um, some hands up. I see Senator Hooker and I. Um, the representative Emmons, and I don't know. Um, and then I see, Sen okay, Senator Lyons and Senator Redmond. And then I thought I saw um, Sen Representative Haas's hand up, but I don't know if by the time other people come, if her hand is still up. Um, Senator Hooker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I agree with uh, Senator Sears about the need for oversight. And um, today we've heard about retention in two different formats. We, we heard about the need for retention in DOC <laughs> and now we're, we've heard about the need for retention in a, a facility such as the one that is being proposed. And I would just like to make sure that we're getting um, the quality of staff that we need. And I am concerned that uh, Becca not having had the experience with these very difficult cases uh, that, you know, we perhaps should look to some place where uh, the experience has been uh, on, on online and that uh, it would be in our best interest to have <laughs> the hybrid model that um, we've been, uh, we've seen proposed. So uh, as much as I appreciate AJ's concern about money being spent on a facility like this that would be taking away from community services, I agree that we have to start somewhere and that um, as Representative Hooper said, <laughs> this is only the beginning of a more uh, complete um, process that we're going through. So thank you. Um, thank you, Senator Hooker. Um, Representative Emmons, then Senator Lyons, Representative Redmond, Representative Haas, Representative Emmons. And thank you. Um, I would like to add in if <clears throat> to our recommendation, <clears throat> if we move forward with Beckett, um, many of you have always heard me say, if you don't have a building, you don't have a program. And I've been through a few battle scars in <coughs> fighting a facility for different uh, needs of the Agency of Human Services. And I see this as no different. Um, this will be a secure building. 
building secure for our juveniles, which means it'll be a locked facility with a fence. And once you get a fence around a building, a community <clears throat> takes notice. So I would like to at least put on the table, we make a recommendation that the department uh, work with local government in Newberry or Wells River, whichever community it's physically housed, and that they have some duly warned meetings for this. Um, I don't want to get down the road and thinking we have a program with Beckett and then the community um, is not supportive of converting the building over to the needs of DCF and Beckett. And I think the community also needs to hear what the future <laughs> use of that facility might be, because if that's not up front with the community, then it will be very, very difficult for any buy-in in the future. So that's what I would recommend um, that we ask for in our recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Um, Senator Lyons, Representative Redman and Representative Haas. Um, Senator Hooker, do you have something you want to add after that? No. Okay. Take my hand down. Sorry. <laughs> Senator uh, Lyons. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I am uh, <coughs> concerned about uh, ongoing programmatic oversight. And I do think that the best way to accomplish uh, system improvements over time is by retaining uh, state employees within um, the building. I, I think having the building uh, as defined and as might be improved over time is perfectly fine. But I do think that the hybrid uh, becomes important uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, the, um, and, I, and, and as an aside, I was trying to find the PhD clinical director in the report and it's gotta be there somewhere if, if Sean, if Commissioner Brown has indicated it's there. Um, but I, I agree with the comments that Senator Hooker has made regarding retention. And uh, I also agree with the comments from Representative Hooper regarding ongoing systematic improvement and so I think our recommendations should include um, something of the clinical oversight, uh, something of the next steps. Uh, but I, I think taking the big step of leaving our, um, uh, you know, not the, not the current, not the state employees who perhaps uh, are no longer uh, efficient at their jobs, but leaving state employees behind at this point I think for me does not make sense. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Um, Representative Redmond. <clears throat> Representative Redmond, are you able to speak now? Sorry, thank you. I was on mute. Um, I have um, real concerns. I mean, I really heard the point about the need for um, community-based services that include uh, placements for those with acute psychiatric issues. I, I really think we cannot let go of that alongside this whole consideration. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, we can really do some work on that uh, coming up because that is a, a growing issue I'm hearing about in my community. Um, I, I too support um, this proposal, um, I uh, would echo what Senator Lyons said. I, I also agree that I think that um, maintaining these positions as state employee positions is a good, is a good move and a way for us to really have eyes and ears and um, quality staff that stay and we don't have constant turnover. I think that's really important. And I would add one other thing that I, I said last, um, last time we had testimony, and that is that I still um, am a big advocate for an Office of the Child Advocate, especially in this setting of uh, trying this new approach um, and not just 
relative to justice involved children, but children across DCF, across foster care, across <clears throat> someone that would have independent eyes on that. So I'll, I'll just throw that out as, a, as something that I'm deeply interested in. I know it's not um, only related to justice involved um, young people, but at any rate, that's something I continue to believe we need in this system of care. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Redmond. Um, represent, um, Representative Haas, Representative Shaw, and um, Senator Baruth. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I think it's important. So I support the proposal, but I think I think we need to keep in mind that that DCF is still in charge here. We are not. We are not outsourcing the care of these children to some company. We are allowing our, or, or the proposal is to allow our state agency to put one piece into the system of care. And my personal um, bias would be that we say yes to the proposal with the following conditions and at the very top of my list of conditions would be that that all children in this in this program be moved to the least restrictive uh, environment ASAP. That that be so. That, so even if it means that some nights there are zero children in this program, <laughs> that what that the focus is on the children and not on the census. We're we're we're, we're agreeing that we need something. For somebody, sometimes we don't know how many that is, we don't know how long that is, but it's about the children, and they are children under our law. Um, and so the, that is, even though it's it's in everything that we've gotten, they say, oh yes, it'll be least restrictive. I want that to be in what we in what our recommendation is going forward. Thank you, um, Representative Shaw, then Senator Baruth. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, I think I'm reasonably sure the people 30 years ago, uh, when Woodside came to being, felt that they had the, uh, the 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 best plan going forward. But they had a plan going forward. Uh, I think we've learned uh, through where we are today that that plan has has aged out, uh, and we're now looking at maybe something new and sometimes new is, is a little bit scary. Uh, the proposal being put forth to us by DCF, and not Beckett, but by DCF, seems to be fairly a fairly solid proposal given today's uh, society's, today's societal needs of our youth. Uh, I, I am concerned uh, that we do not see a, a PhD level uh, director within DCF that would uh, oversee this program. I would hope that, uh, that our recommendation to uh, JFC may, may contain that, that statement. Uh, I also think it's uh, as much as I understand the value of state employees in, and, and I do um, at this late date uh, within this proposal, uh, I'm not sure where we, where we can go with that. I'm not sure what control uh, where DCF could, could go with that. And, and uh, I think that's beyond uh, my scope here anyway. So I, I do support the proposal as, as presented, uh, but I would caveat that with a, a PhD uh, level clinical director for oversight. Thank you, Representative Shaw. Um, Senator Bruce. Uh, I will just support some of the points that have been made previously by uh, Senator Lyons, Senator Hooker, um, and Steve Howard. I, I do think that um, one of the things that we're talking about anytime we talk about privatization is whether or not the people who are going to be working in that environment have the ability to form a career there or whether they will become, uh, you know, people with much more limited protections, much more limited incentives to put their lives into those programs. So that's a big deal for me. 
Um, the other thing I would say is that I'm not convinced about the argument over the lawsuit. I don't believe that the hybrid model would reanimate the lawsuit uh, necessarily, although I suppose it's an outside possibility. Um, but for all those reasons, I support the hybrid model of uh, DCF's proposal. Thank you, um, Senator Berth. Um, is there anyone else who would like to say anything right now? Representative Hooper. One other piece, I, I it feels like we're going to have a longer conversation about who is staffing this facility, but something that we have, so setting that aside, because I believe we'll come back to it. Um, I think we should, um, the, if we enter into a contract with Beckett, there should be some sort of provisions about recouping or protecting our investment in that facility. We're gonna put a good deal of cash into it pretty quickly. Um, and if for some reason we sever that relationship before we've gotten our value out of it, we need to figure out how to recoup it. So I'd like that to be part of um, whatever relationship, if we enter into one, that it be part of the relationship. Thank you. Um, th well, thank you, Representative Cooper. And as we are talking, <clears throat> I realize, um, Bryn, is this a fair thing to ask you to begin to draft? Or how, how are we going? I guess this is, I hadn't talked to you or anyone beforehand or unless um, <clears throat> um, Senator Sears, you have a different <clears throat> idea. No, I, we're making recommendations to the Joint Fiscal Committee. And um, clearly there's a huge difference in money that would need to be appropriated if you choose to go with the with the uh, state employees um, versus the mm -hmm. what was shown in that comparison by Stephanie. So I think that our pref we we could state our preference would be state employees, but understanding the the financial constraints. Sure. Secondly, um, what Mary just talked, what Representative Cooper was just talking about, is an important piece that I thought, uh, maybe uh, Commissioner Brown can correct me, but I thought there was some agreement with Beckett that on uh, recouping the investment um, through the Attorney General's signing off on this agreement. I believe it's the Attorney General has to sign off on this type of contract. Am I wrong or did I dream that or did you say something about that at a prior meeting? Uh, I, uh, Senator, I did speak to that at, um, the, at the prior uh, testimony. Um, we are uh, negotiating um, safeguards to ensure that we uh, uh, will protect our investment in that facility. Um, and we're doing that to, and through two mechanisms. One is a standalone lease agreement um, for a set period of time that allows us to recoup that and then an operating agreement with Beckett so that if if uh, Beckett chooses to um, not run the program in the future or we, or we choose not to have Beckett run the program in the future that we still have access to that facility through that lease agreement for that set period of time. And then we're also in the early stages negotiating what that might look like at the end of that lease term as a like a leased, lease to purchase type agreement as well. And we're uh, bringing in BGS to, to help provide the technical expertise um, in the lease negotiations to ensure we protect that investment. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> I realize, um, Bryn, but is this something that as we get clarity that you are <clears throat> have the time and are able to um, write up so that we have something we can present to joint fiscal, which is, I think, Senator Sears isn't joint fiscal meeting tomorrow or Saturday. Well, or it won't be on this. I believe it's the 20th or I can't remember the date, but they are joint fiscal is meeting on the 20th and that's the date they have to take an action on this. Right. Okay. Okay. So there is a few days. Okay. <clears throat> um, 
<clears throat> Representative Shaw, you, is your hand up for an additional comment? No. Okay. Um, I guess I would like to see, um, I don't know another way of going. Brenna's about. back on if she could answer uh, your question. Oh, sorry. I've been looking at her and she hasn't said no. So I was. Oh, okay. <laughs> So I'm nodding, uh, committee, and yes, this is this is a. Uh, I've been taking notes about what uh, about the conversation, and um, that's my job is to is to write that recommendation for you. So thank you, thank you, <clears throat> thank you. Um, what I would um, it it appears that there is a consensus to go towards um, the Beckett as opposed to the. Um, fully um, separate all state employee, that there is a <clears throat> consensus and we may have conditions, one of which is who are the staff, one of which is other kinds of things um, that we wanna add. But I wanna first, and I don't know any other way of doing it except asking people to um, either turn on their, <clears throat> whatever it is, their, their pictures and raise their hand or we can use the, um, the, the, the visual raise our hand to say how many <clears throat> are we how many people um, think that we we are willing to accept the proposal of contracting with Beckett with conditions but contracting with Beckett Ma would, madam chair yes uh, before we vote uh, it's difficult for me to do it in the order you're asking <laughs> because uh, you're asking first, to choose between the complete state facility and the Beckett one, and then leaving until then the question of the staffing. If the staffing question is decided against the hybrid proposal, then I would be more open to the state version uh, rather than the Beckett proposal. Does that make sense? Uh, um, it, it, it makes perfect sense to me. Senator, what I would be envisioning is that we, <clears throat> if we at this point start with the bigger halves and then we add the conditions and then when we have a package, um, then we vote on the package. Okay, fair enough. Um, it, it, that, that's, but I am open to a different way of doing that if people want to do something different. If people are okay doing it that way, then could we see a show of hands as to who yeah. is whether or not people um, support the um, in general the the going with the Beckett versus a full state separate facility? Please raise uh -huh. your hand, Madam Chair. Yeah, do we need a motion um, to? Could we use a motion oh, that okay. would would recommend the hybrid version? Um, I am trying to, um, if you want to um, start there, I was looking at that as a condition of I the I see proposal. what you're saying, but I- um, and, and then, and then it, with each one, yes, have a motion and whether we add that or not, because there's that, right. there's the other pieces as well. Um, I so so if, if I could uh, quickly jump in, um, yes. you know, going down, I mean, I certainly understand that there may be a preference with this committee for the hybrid model, but we may have a provider that is not open to that. And I just want to throw out there, um, you know, if that's not the case, is there another decision point for the committee or, or are we the proposal I, I just want to understand there's a lot of logistical um, things that are unknown here still. At that uh, uh, Commissioner, I'm not even sure we know where the committee is. Okay. Um, I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. And we're having a discussion on the order and how to take a vote um, and what to vote on first. And um, um, Senator Lyons was going to say something and then Senator Baruth has his hand up. Yeah. No, I will uh, uh, thank you for your clarification on where we are. And um, I think that we have been through the discussion many times and thought we had heard there would be some openness from Beckett for um, a hybrid model. And so now I'm 
get, I don't want to get confused before we go through our uh, discussion and final vote. Um, my, my understanding, and I will have Sean and if there's anyone else who can shed light, my understanding from the way I interpreted what was said was that Beckett is very, very willing to look at people who used to be or who are state employees and who have done the work and have them apply for the job. And then when they apply for the job, that they would be Beckett employees. That is what I understood um, from the questioning. But um, uh, perhaps Sean, and is there, you could say something and then we have, um, um, <clears throat> Senator Bruth has his hand up as well. Uh, 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 Representative Pugh, you are correct. Um, that was their interest. I know early on when we were starting these negotiations and whether this was a path that we both wanted to go down, um, that was one of their threshold questions that if this was, they were going to have to use state employees, they probably wouldn't move forward with it, but that they would be opening to, to hire former state employees as their employees. Thank you. Um, Senator Bruce. So uh, I want I want to support uh, Senator Hooker's suggestion. Oops. I want to support Senator Hooker's suggestion that we um, that we address the question of staffing first, um, because otherwise it puts those of us who don't like the Beckett proposal without the state employees. Um, it puts us in the position of voting for that proposal and then hoping that we get a condition that we like. Um, it seems like there's, as I read it, there's a sentiment of general agreement in, in this joint committee hearing in support of the Beckett proposal. The question is how many people support the, the hybrid version of that. So speaking for myself, I would be more comfortable to address uh, a motion of the hybrid proposal, if that fails, then addressing uh, the, the Beckett proposal, um, which I would vote against in that case. Um, <clears throat> thank you, um, Senator Baruth. I see the hands up of Representative Hooper and um, Sen Senator Hooker. So we have not had a real discussion of what it would look like to have state employees working in a privately owned and operated facility. And I'm rather lost as to how that would work. You know, who would be management? So it, would we have a private sector person supervising a state employee? That, that doesn't sound right to me. Um, you know, th there's just a whole host of kind of issues there that I don't think we've gone down the road to really understanding. Um, I had perhaps incorrectly assumed and should have asked of the commissioner that one of the advantages of going with a private entity was that in fact we had access to their other resources. And I had assumed, for example, if there were a particular kid who needed a particular service that is unique to one clinician or another, that Beckett would, for example, have the ability to bring that person in you know, on an as needed basis. In other words, there are a pool of employees within the Beckett organization that they could bring in and apply to the particular needs of this population. Something that we are not able to do on the state side. We just don't have the depth of it. So I, I think they're kind of interesting management questions as well as kind of the resources available to us to run a good program that we don't understand. Um, and, and I don't know how to gain that understanding if we're, so I don't know. I think it's more complicated than do we support a hybrid model? There's a lot of questions underneath that. Thank you. Um, 
Senator Hooker and then Representative Haas. Senator Hooker, I'm, I'm sure what you say is very important, but we can't hear you. Yep. <laughs> it's my understanding that um, the hybrid model as proposed by the VSEA would include uh, the ability of Beckett to um, partner with other resources and bring them in. The people who would be working with the uh, children would be the, uh, the same uh, positions that were held at Woodside that, you know, these people working with the children would be uh, VSEA or would be Vermont state employees. Whereas um, Beckett would still have the opportunity to uh, work with um, psychologists, psychiatrists, whatever from um, other, you know, other organizations. So I think, Representative Hooper, that there would be that kind of connection with the recommendation that VSEA is making. Um, I would, my concern is that we have the best qualified people applying for the jobs. And Beckett has stated, as, as the commissioner said, would be willing to consider the applications from people who, who had worked in this uh, particular, with this particular population. But I don't know that they would be willing to offer the same types of benefits and salary that uh, they had been used to getting. So. Thank you. Um, Senator Haas, uh, Representative Haas. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, uh, there was a question earlier about um, where we, how we know that the um, um, that Beckett has a PhD um, uh, member making the proposal, and I just wanted to um, look, guide people to Appendix C, and it's on page 22 um, where they set out their their treatment program. Um, one, the vice president has a PhD. Um, so I'm going to um, I'm going to presume that Sen that Representative Haas and Senator Hooker have said what they need to say right now, and that the hands are left over. Um, I want to um, consult with uh, Senator Sears, who is the um, I believe the chair of the Justice Oversight, and if you have a preference as to what the um, what we are what is our first vote. Well, I, my preference would be to uh, have our first vote be um, whether or not the Department of Children and Families should pursue a contract, a hybrid model contract with Beckett. It may be that because of the cost, because of other factors, the, we're making recommendations to the Justice, uh, to the Joint Fiscal Committee. So my preference would to be to, to to, to have Start that, that be a consideration that so, uh, um, so, so, our so, preference so. would be to go with Beckett and use a hybrid model if possible. Okay, so um, my question- I think is, that just leaves that um, the if possible. Um, sure. Because I don't I, know where we'd be if, if uh, you know, with um, joint fiscal, no. they're really gonna look at the money and you're looking right. at- no, that's um, Senator Sears. I don't mean to cut you off. I was not really asking your opinion. I was asking whether that should be the first vote. But no, I think it should. <laughs> but I've, I've I've now got both or whatever, so that's great. Right. So um, I think um, I will. Um, uh, Senator Sears, is that a motion? Yes. That is a motion. Um, we don't have a clerk, but um, uh, um, I can write something. Madam Chair. Um, yes, Senator Baruth. Could, uh, could I clarify the motion? Um, Senator Sears stated it as a hybrid model, if possible. Um, yep. And I, I see where he's going with that. I would, I would not want to vote for that and then have Beckett say, no, we don't want to do that. And then, and then have 
the result of this vote be taken then as not needing another vote to... Senator Sears, is this a friendly amendment? Um, well, it's friendly to the extent that I want to make clear that my, if possible, is the Joint Fiscal Committee and the money. I see. Okay. It, it, it is an additional, what, $2 million? Yes. I think it's one point <clears throat> something. Yeah. 1.5. Yeah. Not um, necessarily Buck Beckett saying no. Um, so, um, Senator Sears, could you please, um, for for all of us, and we have It would be a minutes. big help if, if Bryn would do it. Bryn. <laughs> okay, Bryn, sorry, it's yours now. Can you try to um, say the motion and committee? We have 20 minutes. Go ahead. <laughs> so let's see if I can uh, see if I captured it. So I see it as the motion is whether or not to accept the proposal um, as put forward by the Department for Children and Families to contract with Beckett um, while retaining those um, employee positions as state employee positions. And that is if possible, meaning if um, it is approved by the Joint Fiscal Committee um, and if the money is available. Right. Okay, so that is the motion that is on the table. Um, and uh, without knowing any other way to do it, but to go across the top, um, uh, Representative, Representative Hooper. You're muted. You're asking me to vote on that motion? Yes. Is there just further discussion? Oh, because I'm, I'm presuming that Senator Ruth is seconding the motion. I do second. Is there further discussion of the motion? Can we have it read again, please? <clears throat> and we, we, we are, remember, we are doing this because it is the um, suggestion of um, many of the members of this committee that there, that what will impact their future decisions on what we are doing whether this is a yes or no, that for them, um, the um, employee, the the employees be in fact state employees is a is an important element of the vote, and they want to have that vote first. Ren, could you read it? Sure. Um, so I don't have it written down. I'm just going to uh, say it as I as I remember it. Um, which is to accept the proposal uh, put forward by the Department for Children and Families to contract with Beckett um, in their hybrid model, which would retain those employee positions as state employee positions, um, if possible, meaning if the money is there and if the Joint Fiscal Committee agrees. And just to remind people that we, as a, as a joint set of committees, are only making a recommendation to joint fiscal. So these two committees are only making recommendations. Um, okay. Um, so a clarifying question, please. Yes, yes. If the money is there, in fiscal year FY22 and FY21, um, there's always money, but that means we're not gonna spend it on something else. So how, I don't know what if the money is there means. Could, could I suggest as wording, Madam Chair, um, that we begin the motion with pending approval by the Joint Fiscal Committee. We accept the hybrid model uh, that DCF has proposed retaining yeah. the state positions? Um, the, to be clear, DCF has not proposed the hybrid model. Or, or that, uh, that, that pending... the VSEA. That's, yes. I mean, who, who proposed it is the VSEA. But uh, so in other words, if we, if, we, if we make the conditional part of it pending approval by the Joint Fiscal Committee, uh, we recommend uh, a a hybrid model. Yes. 
it, utilizing it, state employees. Okay. That, that gets rid of the ambiguity of if the money is there. Okay, so if we do this, and if JFC approves it, DCF goes and talks to Beckett and says, okay, here's, here's the way we will agree to this. Mm -hmm. um, and they're gonna say yes or no. And if they say yes, we move on and we figure it out. Or if we say no, if they say no, then we come back and we continue having this conversation. Or, or at that point, the administration just proposed that we'll be back in session. So, so if I could jump in here real quick. So, uh, you know, I appreciate the committee's, you know, deliberations and, and where and where you're heading. I certainly respect that. Uh, but the legislation um, asked this com these committees to make a recommendation whether to approve our plan pursuant to subsection B. And so, if, if you're saying yes, but you're essentially not approving our plan and you're, and you're basically sending us back to start over because that, this is not our plan. We don't support that piece of the plan. There's no indication that um, Beckett um, supports that plan um, and we could be starting back over and it will be the second proposal we've submitted to the legislature, uh, this administration as a replacement for Woodside and you've said no to. Um, and at that point, I don't know if we would put another proposal back on the table, given you said this will be the second time um, the committee has said no, uh, or the legislature has said no. Senator Lyons. Uh, thank you. Uh, the way I look at it is this. We had uh, recommendations that came to us, and we felt that there were additional recommendations that could be made. And so I, I, I believe that um, when whenever the legislature looks at recommendations, we do have some authority to modify. Uh, if we were doing this through legislation, we would certainly be modifying it based on all the testimony that we've taken. So it, I, I am so uh, impressed by the work that has been done. Nevertheless, I think there are concerns that have been expressed and we would like those concerns to be carried forward to the Joint Fiscal Committee. Um, as the person who is facilitating this meeting, um, uh, the reason that I had proposed the, um, the process of starting with the, do we accept the proposal or not is, um, because that is how I saw our, our um, charge. And that if we then had um, concerns or things that we wanted to also be considered that that was part and parcel of that. Um, I have been um, sort of that, 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 that way of going about went um, down the, you know, it's fine. I have no, um, but um, what I do want to say, I'm going to say, because I have kept my, um, my opinion to myself. Um, if this were an easy decision, if we knew what, if we knew what was best for Vermont, for Vermonters, for uh, the youth that we're talking about, and for workers, we wouldn't be, have wrestled with this for the past four years. Um, and um, I wish I knew what the best plan is and what the best way is. Um, I will say that I will not be supporting, um, and, um, and I say this with trepidation, um, I'm, a, I'm a union member. Um, I'm a member of the union of, at UVM. Um, in the world of human services, rightly or wrongly, um, the state of Vermont contracts out to private nonprofit agencies to provide and do nine tenths of the services. And I don't see this as being any different than um, whether it was contracting out to what is now known as the Bennington School for whatever, or what used to be known as Laraway, all those things. And um, this is going to be a difficult enough population. This is a difficult enough population. 
um, and really good people have worked really hard and done tried to do really good jobs and have um, at the same time um, people have raised issues and there have been court decisions and there's all sorts of reasons why um, but I think having a, a a treatment and a therapeutic and a structure and organization of a service where people people's bosses are not are the state as opposed to Beckett. How are, I mean, I, I, you know, I think that that is just setting up something um, and that I think it's really, we perhaps we put in a condition that they, much like for veterans or other things, that state employees who apply for the job um, have a, you know, get a few points in terms of being, you know, um, being appropriate for the job. But if they want the job, they become Beckett employees. This is not gonna necessarily be the same job as what is at Woodside. Woodside, which had people on for, what was it, 48 hours, a 48 hour shift, um, and they were living there. That's not necessarily, I don't know what Beckett's thing is. Um, but anyway, um, let us um, go with the uh, motion that is on the table um, from Senator Sears that Bryn has re-read. In light of your comments, Madam Chair, I, I, I'm fine with withdrawing the motion and just voting on the proposal and then having a second, if that passes, having a second vote that our preference would be to hire state employees. Um, and that can pass or fail, but that we, um, if you wanna have those two votes separately, I'm fine with withdrawing for now. And then I would move that we, I have a second that what I um, okay. and the portion of the state employees. Uh, you know, I I think it should be explored. I don't. I um, yeah, whichever way you prefer to do it, Madam Chair. Um, why don't we have that first vote then? Um, I have to say that was my preference, and I was not okay. um, persuaded. Okay. With all due well, respect. then I you know then I would move that we approve the plan, and the, but that we have a second vote on whether or not to okay. ask the Joint Fiscal Committee, recommend the Joint Fiscal Committee to explore the use of state, a, a, a hybrid model of state employees. So the first vote is to, um, of the two proposals, to support to um, support the Beckett. Oh, there's only one. There's oh, only one proposal. Okay. To, to to support the um, to to support with conditions, and then we will outline what those conditions are conditions later. Are. Right. No, that, that's what you want. Um, uh, Senator Baruth doesn't want that. He has his hand up. So I I will just explain I. If we do it this way, I will vote no, and I'll just no. quickly explain. And there may be a number of others who vote no. Yeah, I'll, I'll just explain one thing. <clears throat> what we would do then is we would be signing off on the proposal, and then we would have a conditional condition. And, and the condition would say to the Joint Fiscal Committee, do you want to spend another 1.4 million or not? And they would say, well, they already signed off on privatizing the service anyway. So let's just say we don't want to do that. So I, it puts it puts those of us who support the state employees in the position of authorizing their removal and then asking if it's okay if we get them back. So they've already been removed. Right. Well, I, I'm just saying in the light of our votes here, um, that's why I'll be uh, okay. I'll fine, be fine. Um, I, yeah. I'm sorry. I feel like we are arguing over parliamentary procedure. Bryn, could you go back to the original um, motion that um, uh, Senator Sears made, which um, has to do, which talked about um, something about if joint fiscal agrees or something. And and I would put that forward under my name since uh, Senator Sears is now not. Uh, well, he may uh, want to go back to it. He want he may want okay. to go back to it. Um, Bryn, can you? <laughs> Is this the recom is this are you voting on the proposal, the quote hybrid proposal for with this motion, or is this the regular believe, of no, no, we are voting on the hybrid 
we're going to vote on the hybrid. Um, so, um, okay. Yeah. So, um, so you would be voting on um, the following proposal pending approval by the Joint Fiscal Committee. Um, you recommend a hybrid model of the Department for Children and Families proposal to contract with Beckett in a manner that would retain the employee positions as state employee positions. Perfect. I believe that reflects what um, Senator Baruth and um, 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 and 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 Senator I would Hooker. Second and Senator, that. Okay, se seconded by Senator Hooker. Okay. Um, if we can uh, start now, um, we don't have a clerk, so I will, um, Representative Hooper. Um, I, I'm sorry, I do not understand how this would work well enough to be able to vote in favor. So I have to vote no. And okay. I'm really disappointed that it's being characterized as an anti-union vote and because that it could, not be further from the truth as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Um, thank you, Senator Rep Representative um, Hooper. Senator Hooker. Yes. Um, Representative Shaw. Um, you're, you're, you're muted. Okay. Uh, no. Representative Haas. No. Representative West, a uh, Senator Restman. No. Representative Emmons. No. Senator Lyons. Yes. Representative Grad. No. Senator Baruth. Yes. Representative Paella. Paella. Sorry, I, I I won't ever apologize. Okay. Uh, no. Um, Senator Sears. I can't hear you. Yes, I'm sorry, yes. Um, uh, Representative Redmond. Yes. And Representative Pugh is a no. Oh God, was anyone keeping track? I was. Uh, thank you, Peggy. Five. Um, and, can I just reread it to make sure that I got it correctly? Yep. Um, Hooper, no. Haas, no. Shaw, no. Hooker, no. No, Hooker was a yes. Oh, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on one, sec one second. Bear with me. Hooper, no. Haas, no. Shaw, no. Westman, no. Edmonds, no. Lyons, yes. Grad, no. Baruth, yes. Paella, no. Sears, yes. Uh, Pew, no. Um, who did I? Redmond, Redmond, oh, Redmond, yes. And then the fourth person, I, I might have, did I miss anybody? No. Hooker. Uh, Wait, Hooker, are you? Hooker is a, is a, I was a yes. I think it was five to nine, wasn't it? No, five to eight. I think there's five only 13 eight. of us here. Yep. Okay. We could add a few if you'd like to yeah. go yeah. to the presidential <laughs> level, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So I have one, two, three, four, five yeses. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight noes. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, that motion failed. Do I have another motion? So to move we accept the plan, but that we ask the okay. department to look at the hybrid model as well as the joint fiscal. Yes. And I think we had a, a, another set of some other conditions that Bryn was going to draft up that I don't think we had any dispute. With. Well, I don't, yeah, I don't think there was any dispute. We can okay. just send them along to the joint. Okay. So the other conditions being um, a no reject, being clear about that, being um, 
the least restrictive ASAP. Um, Connecting with the communities. Um, Early and, morning meeting with the community. Mm -hmm. And, and, and some the arrangement for recapture of the, the lease of the, the lease of the money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And I would add that the facility be limited to justice involved use. I think that's implicit. Think it, about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it is, but yeah, but say it. It's fine. Okay. I, I would be interested in the um, the clinical director at DCF being a PhD level uh, credentialed person. Psychologist. At DCF or at, I'm sorry, I'm confused. At DCF uh, or a, at the Beckett? Uh, no, at D, the, the person who's interfacing at DCF. Um. It, for, we can add that that position is not solely related to this proposal. I believe we heard from the commissioner that this is a position that they are considering that the legislature will have to that they're considering to um, be an oversight of all of the youth in placement from multiple um, avenues. Is that correct, Senator? Uh, sorry, Commissioner Brown. That is correct. Yes. And then if I could just say that all, all of those other areas you just touched on, no eject, reach, reject, least restrictive, uh, the least, the community engagement, um, and only justice involved use, uh, we support all of those. And, and, and th those will be things we do engage in but we're fine with the committee recommending them as well. Okay. Um, Senator Sears, can you um, sort of restate the, 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 um, the first part of the motion so that we know what we, we accept are voting the report on? of the commissioner. We recommend that the department as well as the Grand Fiscal Committee um, look at the other conditions that we just went through. Um, and additionally, uh, look at whether or not it makes sense to have state employees um, under the, well, that was just defeated, but <clears throat> to look at that or whether state employees should be given a preference in hiring at the new program. The, the, the state of putting a condition of state employees on it was, was uh, defeated, am I correct? So, so my motion would be that they look at either of those two alternatives. So to, that, that, that it be, that they explore, as explore. A, or something like that, um, yeah. how, they Just explore, explore either one of those uh, options. Okay. Sorry, I, I lost uh, clarity on that there. Um, it seemed as though originally Senator Sears was proposing that we ask joint fiscal to consider state employees being in the new facility, yeah. then then it is is that right, Senator Sears? Or well, we've just defeated a motion to make that a requirement. So I was so, so asking now, them to explore it. But but the it that they're exploring is what uh, whether or not it should be state employees. Okay. Or we should give a preference to state employees in the hiring under Beckett. Well, if it's one, I will vote yes. If it's the no. other, I would vote no. So no, if you're good, if, it's, if we're, if it's we're neither one, neither one is a condition of approval. Yeah. Um, right. um, I, 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 we just, it was just defeated. And so I wanted to keep the, keep it alive in some manner so that it could be considered. And, but, but, but in, in so some form, point, I, I don't know why we vote on it again, that's all. Okay, so to be clear then, your your motion does not include exploring keeping the jobs as state employees. Oh no, it does, it would explore that, yeah. Okay. It's not I'm, a condition. I, I feel as though you're sometimes saying yes, sometimes saying no. 
So can well, I? Maybe just... I am, and maybe I'm not. I don't know. Um, I'm uh, trying to keep the whole idea of exploring as it, whether or as not I. the program okay, should so, have state so, employees, but we so, just defeated the right, motion. That, I voted for your motion. That motion left. Yes. That motion failed. So right. what, what Senator Sears is trying to do, what this committee is trying to do, is there are about four things that we seem to agree on that are conditions. And we actually heard that the commissioner thinks that those are okay. Then there's something which is not a condition of approval, but something that we are asking them to explore, which is okay. how to handle, how to take care of, how to um, respond to state employees. And we are suggesting two ways that maybe state employees might or might not be interested in. One of, and, and Beckett may or may not be, and whether if no one likes them, we are, all we're asking is that that be a conversation. One being that they remain, that, that, that somehow state employees work for Beckett, but they, they retain, they are state employees. They're, they're, and their workstation is at Beckett. And another thing maybe to explore is okay, someone's worked, been a state employee long enough, they're gonna be able to keep their benefits or their retirement. They're up for a new um, exploration. And um, so maybe they'd be given a leg up, but, they would, but um, um, they would be interviewed. Maybe they'd be given a leg up, um, but they would no longer be state employees. I mean, you know, Whatever. I mean, is it to, to keep a job? Is it to keep, um, or you know, do we want to make a condition that people explore unionization? Do they have to be? I mean, sorry, we're going down a rabbit's hole. Um, Representative Shaw. So we we just defeated a motion mm -hmm. to uh, make it a requirement to have state employees. Uh, as the employee in the facility. Uh, and so we defeated that. So we moved on to approving, I believe we're approving the proposal with some four conditions that you had outlined earlier and, and uh, giving the state employees uh, the opportunity to be first interviewed, I guess is the way I would put it. Are we also, are we also saying that we want the state we want state employees and state employees in the facility i, I don't, I don't want to vote on the same motion twice is what i want to do and i don't want to scuttle the proposal i want the proposal to move forward uh, so i'm just a little confused there and i think i heard you say that these are just recommendations representative Pew. that that was my understanding of where senator sears was going that this last piece around state employees was a um, a please please ask the question, please explore. Um, whatever the answer is will not be. Um, is that right, Senator Sears? Whatever That's the correct. answer um, is, is, you know, um, will not scuttle the proposal. I understand okay. I lost. I, I understand that we were in the negative on the lost mm -hmm. that motion. I'm just asking that it still be considered. Yeah. Okay. So we have we've we've already voted to approve. We to, approve it. We approve it. And uh, this would be approving with four. I think four or five conditions, whatever oh, that we, number we, was, mm -hmm. yeah. and then additionally asking them to continue to explore. But, but the proposal's approval is not subject to either one of those last two explanations. Correct. No. Correct. Okay. Which, which okay. still may lead Senator Baruth to vote no. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, when, my only problem remaining is that we keep using the word explore and then different people are interpreting explore to mean a host of different things. So we're, we're not looking at wording of emotion which is problematic. 
So I guess the, the question is really, are we asking joint fiscal to explore the possibility of state employees in the facility? Now, in my mind, we haven't decided that question because the previous motion was to do it. This is to explore it, which is something different. So um, the only clarity I'm seeking is, are we asking to ex JFC to explore state employees in the facility or not? I actually thought we were asking um, the department. <laughs> or, or the department. Yeah, either one. Yeah. Or the department in its uh, in any uh, it would seem to me it would have to be uh, with the contract between the d department and uh, and Beckett. I mean, there are going to be a lot of conditions around how we're paying the three million dollars and and then the ongoing <coughs> payment for, of um, property taxes and so on. So it would seem to me that this would be a part of that um, discussion. And, and then we also know that after a period of time, we may actually be eligible to own that property, I think. So, oh, we forgot that one. Yeah, I know. So <laughs> I'm just saying there is a lot there. And, but I, I, uh, I continue in the same vein as Senator Bruth has been talking that uh, we need to have that exploration or that inclusion of a condition, some kind of condition. I won't say if at all practicable, but I think that's what it does come down to. So the question is who does that exploration? JFC or DCF? DCF. Well, if it's a condition uh, not... that joint fiscal committee uh, agrees with, they can then, as the money is uh, appropriated can have DCF do that work. I don't think that's the work of the legislature. Legislature, I think that I, is, you know, it's administrative work. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, I heard Representative Shaw loud and clear. He doesn't want to vote on the same thing over again. So yeah, none of us clear. Do. Uh, no, and so I wanted to <laughs> make clear. Except you and Senator Bruce. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that. I don't think I do. All I want. I will, I, I just want to make sure that we continue to, to, to keep the option open if the Joint Fiscal Committee wishes to go with that. That was the explore. I'm not asking us to vote on the same thing again. What you're asking, Senator Sears, is just another look at the yep. option of having <clears throat> state employees. Bryn, do you have any sense of how that might read? Sorry. So what I hear is that you would be, um, according to the directive in the budget bill, um, you would be, pending approval from the Joint Fiscal Committee, you would be recommending um, DCF's proposal to contract with Beckett and then period, and then separately, you would be asking the committee and or the department to consider um, having state employees fill the positions in the new facility or giving preference to state employees in hiring, um, in Beckett's hiring. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that's where everyone is. There's a difference between consider and explore. Because this committee on a seven, something boat said no. I mean, you know, in terms of having it be a I condition. use the term explore if you'd rather consider yeah. it. I like consider. The committee's already sort of said no to that. I think the term explored is different. 
I, if it's consider or explore, I can go with explore as well. Yeah, explore is fine. Um, Representative Shaw. Thank you. Um, my, 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 my concern, uh, and, and, and honest concern is if Beckett just comes back and says no uh, to state employees run this facility and basically that's what will happen. We're, we're nowhere. We just spent four years doing nothing. Um, and Representative Shaw, I personally share that I, I don't want to be back here in three years having this same conversation which is why I keep saying, I think, you know, people really, uh, certain people really want this piece in there. And so how do we put this piece in there in a way that will not stop us going forward, no matter what the answer is. So I'm willing to say if Beckett goes, hey, fine, this is the best thing since sliced bread, we want to do this. Okay. Um, but if Beckett goes, no way, you know, this is not workable then I don't want it to, to stop it. Um, it wouldn't under this motion. So, Madam Chair, yes. this, our charge is to make a recommendation. This mm -hmm. is not cast in stone. Yes, and, we've, so, and, and we are trying to be respectful to the five of you who wanted something that the rest of the committee didn't. And we're trying to keep that thread alive. I, I understand that and I can, I too can go with explore, but it keeps it alive. But again, it's a recommendation. This isn't the final vote on any of this. I mean, we don't have the final say. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So, there you go. I, I think personally, the motion as stated is an accurate depiction of the committee's division on We have a motion on the table. Um, I believe, Dick, um, with a lot of massaging from your friends, it's your yep. motion. Um, yep. is, there, is there a second? Second. I'll second it. Um, Senator Westman is seconding it. Is there further discussion? OK. Um, We'll, we'll start the other way. Um, Senator Sears. Yes. Um, Representative um, Paella. Yes. Uh, Senator Westman. Yes. Representative Emmons. Yes. Senator Lyons. Yes. Representative Brad. Yes. Senator Baruth. Yes. Representative Haas. Yes. Representative Shaw. Yes. Senator Hooker. Yes. Representative Hooper. Yes. Representative Pugh. Yes. Oh, sorry. Representative Redmond. Yes. <laughs> um, the, uh, motion passes unanimously. Um, I think our discussion, thank you committee, um, and thank you um, all the members who uh, both today and last week, two weeks ago, testified. And actually some of us have been having these conversations um, for probably the past, what, I don't know, when, when did we meet, you know, the past two years? At least two um, years. Um, and uh, if this was easy, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't still be here. Um, and um, I really thank everyone's hard work and um, it's challenging and um, none of us are doing something that is easy for any of us. Um, so, uh, and Senator Sears is on joint fiscal, I believe. Yep. What? As nope. is Representative Hooper. And as is Representative Hooper. So, we, uh, so the committee has representation um, on joint fiscal. Um, so that will be a fun meeting for you all on the 20th. Um, and yes, we will. Um, 
And um, Representative Redman, I'm not quite sure whether that's a, a, a high five or whether you have something you want to say. No, just that's great. I mean, the continuity onto that committee having representation is 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 worth applause. Yeah. So um, thank you all very much. And thank you for staying later so that we could actually make a um, um, a clear record. Um, do, do our job, which was to um, come to a recommendation to send to joint fiscal. So congratulations, um, everyone for working through our our, our differences and finding um, a path forward. Um, and Bryn, if you have any questions or whatever, please just run them by, um, I, I believe Senator Sears is chair of joint justice. Yep. And so between, um, just run them by the, the two of us will be great. Thank I you, will. Madam Chair, for your effort today. And I want to also recommend your comments and thank the entire committee and all those who worked on this for two to three years, four years, whatever it's been. Um, I think this does move things forward for kids. Uh, that's what it's really all about. It is good. Um, I apologize. I have um, a, a 16 students who are waiting for me in six minutes. So I need to um, uh, jump off. Uh, thank you all very much. And um, I believe this ends uh, the, the meeting of the two committees, Justice um, Oversight and Child Protection. Um, on the question of um, making a recommendation related to